Good morning, councillors. Uh, today being the 16th of May, 2023, uh, we are at our annual plan submission process. The most important thing is, is I need to remind all councillors, and this is a little bit of housekeeping before we go through this meeting, that all the meetings are being live streamed. We, each one of the submitters does have five minutes. That five minutes needs to include questions. So if you are asking questions, please make sure your questions are clarifying questions. Uh, we will let all submitters know that the, when they're doing their submissions that we have read all their submissions and they're ready to add more information to their submissions as they come through. Um, you should have received a bit of paper with saying what the submission numbers are. It's also been put on the screen there for you as well so that you can see it. And we may have changes as we go through the day, solely on the respect that as submitters come in. So we first in, first serve with submitters. So if a submitter does come in, top, in early and there is time, we will take them in early. Okay, so pretty much stop standard practice on that. Uh, on that respect, I'm going to ask for Councillor Roca to open the meeting with the centres. Sure, we that. Uh, yep, start us off with a bit of karakia, get us going. Uh, hopefully we can look after each other through the day. I'm going to go in the middle of the day. I'm going to go in the middle of the day. I'm going to go in the middle of the day. I'm going to go in the middle of the day. I'm going to go in the middle of the day. I'm going to go in the middle of the day. Kia tau te mauri ki runga ki tēnei whare, kia tau te mauri ki runga ki tēnei whānau, tūkuna nō te whai oro oro tānei te wai ora, tēnei te matatau kāke, tēnei te kaupapa kāke, makatū, tāre watū ki te rangi, uhi, uero, tau mai te mauri, hau e, hui e, tāke. Kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Ruka. Right, Councillors, it's a very good day today, we have annual submissions. And we have all of these wonderful submissions coming in. Now we originally had uh, 60, was it 70 people asking for? And we're down to down to 53. So we had around 63 asking, so we're down to 53. Great to see those who have turned up. Great to see those online. So we're gonna start out with the first one, uh, which is Brent Hill, which is on volume one, page 52. Brent, would you like to come forward to you? And, and have your submission. This is this is your five minutes. A bell will be rung at four. But as I, as I said before, if um, we encourage you that we actually read your submission and to talk more to, to about your submission or any additional information you'd like to add. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, councillors, for uh, having to listen to me. Um, my submission is to keep the rate rise at seven percent. Um, the reasons for this is purely financial. My situation at the age of 46, my wife has had three strokes. There's no longer a family. Myself, in 2021, I had to give up work through ill health. The extra 3% rate rise would mean for me an extra $80 on my rates. That represents just over a a week's groceries for me. Um, you know, we even know about the cost of living and how hard things are to make a roof over a head. The income I get from work and incomes combined from my wife and myself works out to be $17 an hour if I was working at least one You know, things, things are pretty hard, aren't they? Yeah, I've lost in my way what I was going to say. Um, I think you know, the council have got major expenses to come in, but at the end of the day, the poor old rate payer is not a cash cow. You know, I've got to take my money, you know, all the expenses you've got. And that extra $80 for me is just yeah, it's seriously hard. I'd like to go and buy myself you know, welders and things like that to keep myself occupied when I can work. Um, but you just got to realise you just can't afford it. And that's all there is to it. It's nice having the shiny things, but at the end of the day, there is needs and wants. And there's a big difference between the two. And for me, when you see something like 
the old town hall or something like that, the council builds millions to that, to keep that going, you're thinking, oh, really? Comes back to the ratepayers to pay for it. I can't go to work and income to say, well, I'll pay the council to put my rates up. Can I have an extra 3%? You're just going to say no. And at the end of the day, all I want to be able to do is afford to pay my bills and keep a roof over my head. And with the spiralling cost, you're thinking, is it worthwhile? Over the years, I've worked extremely hard to be able to afford to own my own house, which I'm very, very lucky to be able to do that. More betrayed on. And there's a lot of other people that have been worse off than me. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people in the same boat as me as well. It would be nice for me to be able to work, but you would have seen me trying to walk up here, and this is the average day for me. This disease I've got is horribly, horribly painful. And that's what's led me not to be able to work anymore at the age of 58. Um, so I'd just like to thank the council, Premier, for taking the time to listen to me the nice situation that I'm trying to work on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look, we really appreciate your submission, especially appreciate you taking the time to come here and actually submit verbally. Um, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort. Councillors, is there any questions, any clarifying questions at all? Thank you very much. Um, you can stay in the seat and listen to the others if you'd like. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Now, councillors, I've just been one, reminded by the wonderful Nicolene here that I had a few administration things that I completely forgot to do, and my apologies with that. Um, we, we have two apologies, uh, one from Councillor Govich and Councillor Golightly. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Councillor Benny's moving, Councillor Harding seconding. All those in favour? Now we also have, uh, we also have to note that we're receiving to hear submissions relating to the consult consultation documents, uh, that we, re we have received, received and heard submissions relating to the statement of proposal for the 2023-2034 fees and charges, and that submissions have been identified as being received after the closed date of submission period, prior to the closure of the meeting, be accepted for consideration by Council. Now these are documents, uh, volume 10 and 11 that you have received either over the last day or so and over the last night we received volume 11. Do I need to move the second as well? Do I have a mover for that? Councillor McConnell, Councillor Holmes. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you for that slight administration area there. Uh, I think we also have one more too, don't we? Which is to extend the meeting after six. That will come later, okay. Councillors, there is also an administration one which we a motion that we may have to do later on if we go over if we're going to go over six hours. We are required to move a motion to allow us to go over that time period. So just for your heads up that, that may happen later on. Uh, the second submittal we have is on volume one, page 140, and it's oh no, I've got it sorry, wrong, page uh, volume eight, page thirty-two. It's Colin Blackman. Would you like to come forward, Colin? <coughs> Once again, Councillors, Colin is on uh, volume 8, page 32. Okay, Councillors, ladies and gentlemen, start that. Under the Open Government Act 2002, Section 12, 2, the comment is prepare long term financial strategies, including funding, financial management, and investment policies. Now, I see this as real difficult to be carried out for a couple of reasons, but let's just look at one aspect, and that is the fundraising uh, airport, which apparently is still on the list of things to do. My view and my suggestion show it because it is impossible in the scene to know exactly what criteria you're dealing with. For example, 
within New Zealand, and I spent 28 years with them, within New Zealand to get the aircraft, they factor in frequency and load factor. And those are the two items which they are stuck with once they've got the aircraft. Maintaining the service to Whangarei also relies on frequency and load factor. As the load factor falls, the frequency drops. So the issue here is that once Air New Zealand starts to hurt enough, once the red ink becomes too great, they will drop the service to Whangarei and you'll get a second tier fee airline like Great Barry Airlines who will do a twin engine drop jet at lesser seats and fly at a lesser height and still maintain the service. But that changes the um, criteria for the runway for the airport issue. The other um, aspect which comes into this is that while Air New Zealand won't give you an idea of when they get to that critical point of stopping the service, some research could be done, such as if you were to contact the fire service or the airport tower, you, for example, would be able to discover that in 2019, Air New Zealand had X number of services running through Whangarei, and that would be a number of seats for the year, whether it's going in or coming out as academic. Therefore, it would give you some clue if you compared 2019 with 2021, 2022, and you'd see how the frequency was dropping off as Air New Zealand was catering for the swamp of red ink. So that's one aspect. The second aspect, which really has nothing to do with um, Whangarei Council per se, but there will be a spin-off effect. In 2021, I think it was, I went online and found an overview of five cruise ships that are up on a hard slip being cut up for scrap. Now, one thing that somebody could do is contact the Napier port in 2019, that report was getting something like 70 odd movements per month, of which there were a number of cruise ships. So, by comparing again 2019 with 221, uh, sorry, 2021 and 2022, you get a clear idea of the drop off in, in tourism traffic. So, without going into all the other things that are on your wish list of projects to do, I would say the important three things is look into the issue of low cost housing, keep the roads up to scratch by maintenance, and retire debt. Don't take on more debt, especially if it is um, incorporating increases. And then perhaps as a uh, final gesture, all our councillors could take a 20% cut in their stipend and therefore help the rate payers in general. <laughs> there you go, folks. That's it. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for your submission. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, again, we give the councillors an opportunity here. Is there any clarifying questions from the councillors? No, there's not. Thank you again, Colin. And if you want to, you can stay in the back there and listen to the other submitters, or it's up to you. Okay, thank you. Our next submitter we have is Robin Leithman. Uh, Robin, the Good floor morning. is yours. As you, you know this process fairly, fairly well in the past, uh, you have five minutes. We, we try to encourage you to not speak, not read your submission. We have read it. And for the councillor's knowledge, it's on page, it's on volume three and page 15 in the paper version or page 23 in the electronic version. Sorry, 21 in the electronic version. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Good morning to the councillors. I will be reading because it's an extension of what I've already given you. Um, I'm very, very aware that you're in a hell of a position with inflation at 5.9%. That makes anything for me so, so difficult, but I do appreciate that. But in further addressing the 10.9 or the 7.9 rates increase, I believe in recognising just how horrific this is for so many families and others on fixed incomes, it is important for Council to address this year projects that only reflect needs, not wants. In looking at the road and performance measures targeted, I suggest that the 85% 
for maintenance of the roads meet the council level of service targets as specified in our road maintenance contracts is not being met at all. And the target of up to 95%, the percentage of customer service requests relating to roads and footpaths to which the Territorial Authority responds within the time frame specified in the LTP is also not being met. I cannot prove this, but I believe that the public certainly believes that our roads are badly neglected. Further, the recent storm events have created a need to review all funding of the roading expenditure as it is for this year in the LTP. I ask Council to postpone all cycleways in this year's plan, which gives three million for you, and I also ask you postpone seal extensions, another three million, and put the total into the seal road pavement rehabilitation and seal road resurfacing, identifying the network pavement depths and conditions to gain the greatest effect from this investment. Particular emphasis should be given to the urban road network. This has the greatest impact on residents and results in the high level of dissatisfaction felt in the community. The council needs to be bold. In communicating this, give the community a sense that the most urgent matter of roads and storm damage has been given top priority. I say to you, be bold. I believe the public would be far more sympathetic to your 7.9 or your 10.9 if you came out strongly saying, we're cutting back on some of the things we'd like to do, but we're going to address the most urgent matter that is affecting everybody. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you very much. Um, councillors, is there any clarifying questions? No, Robin, thank you thank again. You. Thank you for your time. And as I said to the other submitters, you will log sort of back there and, and listen to the others. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, our next submitter is, Von, is, is Kim Robinson. Come on up, Kim. Uh, Kim's submission is on volume one, page one. 67. Good morning. Just got up a few minutes ago, getting dressed for me and everyone. Thank you for allowing me to present to you this morning. I'm just here speaking for myself. I'm not hearing any other capacity just personally. My submission relates to if we're raising the road capacity to 3%, does this include footpaths? Well, that's my question, I'm just asking. This is just, this, this is a time for you to make a submission to us and to tell us what you want. I'm just asking to clarify, will that include the footpath area? Or? Quite important because I've told you for quite a few times with different issues that we need access, um, mobility scooters, walkways, that sort of thing. Find me footpaths are a bit hopeless. I've sent you some photos. <laughs> what happened outside my house, for example? Just on the footpath here. Using bitumen. That's not good for mobility scooters or disability access. People with uh, vision impairments, walking impairments. This morning on the way to come here, I saw a guy on a mobility scooter, it was just so small that you're going to be able to move and manoeuvre. It's 2023 now. And we're living on sort of um, terrain that's kind of back from the 30s in some places. So please focus on fixing that out. Um, so that roading commitment, please try and include footpath areas in that as well. 
Because I'm wondering, are we sort of what point for some of us? It's really more fearful people like myself. So that's really my sort of idea this morning, just to remind you. Thank you very much, Kim. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for your submission. Um, is there any clarifying questions from the councillors? No? Kim, if you'd like to, you're able to... Oh, sorry, you guys. One more thing. On Jack Street, if you've seen, if you've driven down here, it's quite rough, the roading down here. But it doesn't really make sense how it's set out. There's some giant trees, two good trees there. I don't really know what the planning process was there. Nothing makes sense there. With the trees sort of getting in the way around the road. If a disability, a lot of my friends also have disabilities. Um, and one tree, especially by my house, stuff's always falling down. Like acorns and things and other things just falling debris all over the place quite consistently. It's really not quite safe for a lot of my friends as well. Even just like the plant, the planting and the trees and everything needs to be looked at. It's just unsafe. And it damages a lot of our vehicles and things as well. And the guttering, everything's overflowing, it's damaging the road, it's a flow on effect. Really just from how things have been planted in the past. So yeah, that's something else we can probably look at at Bargaday as well, how we're planting trees as part of the plan. So that's the most of it, thank you. Thank you Kim, appreciate your time. And um, we, we look forward to hearing more from you later on at other times. Uh, and councillors, again, I'm just double checking, there's no clarifying questions. Okay, so thank you Kim, you're welcome to sit at the back, but thank you again for coming along. Actually, I'll go grab a coffee, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, councillors, our next submitter has not turned up, so we have a five minute break. Oh, we have one more speaker? Okay, all right, so we'll just wait for the next speaker here. So, uh, as you can see, the uh, councillors, uh, as Christopher comes in, it's by, uh, he is on volume two, pages ten in the paper version, pages twelve in the digital version. Welcome, Christopher. Sorry to, to rush you in like that, but you're here and. Um, You've got five minutes. The bell will ring after four. We encourage you that we have read your submission. We have gone through your submission. So I will encourage you to speak to your submission and spend this time for you, okay? Thank you. Uh, I just, I haven't got it in front of me, so I'm just going off memory. If you've got a pencil handy, uh, you can start at the bottom of the top, the bottom bit, or the top bit. But the first bit I thought, in quotes was we hear you and I think that's the what I wanted to share was that really council need to listen to the constituency and be able to reflect that they are listening and in sync with them there's a lot of division in the world we know about it so it would be I think wise for you to take that on board uh, when you're making your deliberations on many things uh, <clears throat> Uh, if you've got a pen beside, I, I've said no to three quarters, uh, but yes to um, cooperation. Could you add in collaboration and coordination alongside cooperation? So I think that will be important uh, as we look to resolve many issues. Uh, the idea of the, of the planning process, and I just had a look at a couple of uh, quotes again this morning for planning. It's quite nice to go back and see what people like Churchill or Eisenhower might say about plans and planning. Uh, 
have a business review uh, says that it really is a sort of a, a means to an end, not always an end in itself. And things are always changing. And I guess when some of these plans were made, we weren't aware of some of the events in the world, uh, climatic, many things. So uh, I wouldn't be afraid to revisit plans and keep planning and keep modifying plans. Uh, I made a note about Aruku uh, as a, as a, for hotel accommodation. I do believe we need it uh, as in hotel accommodation. Aruku, when I step it out from Westpac, is about 10 minute walk with no cover. Uh, so I would call that a destination hotel. And if you were designing and planning, and marketing, you take that into consideration. In the middle of winter, you're not going to dash at your lunch break into town to visit Spark or farmers to get a new clean shirt because you spilled tomato sauce from your sausage roll uh, down the front, or to get something, uh, some stationery. Because I think the idea around was about helping move the CBD forward. Plans like the Hundabasa Art Centre uh, and Wairau Maori Art Gallery. Uh, I, I, I do think you did the right thing in doing what you could to support it. From what I read, it was a shortfall. Um, the idea of having a CBD hotel, and I think there was talk around having something on Fire Brigade Hill. If I was that investor, uh, a good idea, right in town. You'd be able to come down, beautiful park, and get under the eaves of the building and frequent the restaurants, go to Spa, go to Farmers, go to Helmenstein, you had access. You won't have that from a Ruku. So it's, I would say a CBD hotel would have been a convenient, look through the lens of convenience, it would have been handy. But now that someone's put a mental health and addiction service building, uh, right there. If I was that investor, I'd be asking myself, do I want to bring my clients into that vicinity? I don't see them as a natural fit. Uh, I would. I will be supporting uh, uh, four lanes, and I, I will be supporting double tracking the rail. And the word I'd put around that is about having access. It's all about access. Access to services. Access to the city access to amenity, access to employment, it, uh, yeah, that would be a word I'd put around many things, it's around gaining access. <coughs> the Hikarangi Swamp, I'd be thinking around, yeah, I'm just taking up a couple of minutes, I think we do need to re-look re at that, there's going to be, I've just put reconfigure, restore and redevelop. Uh, it could be seen as a carbon sink. We need to uh, <coughs> look at opportunities to, uh, for flood prevention. I think there's just really a new lens to look at many things. If I could leave you with well, one last thing, we must be running out of time, the bell is about to go. It's often about attracting talent and that what you do in your plans and what you decide to do will be attractive or not to other people. Given Australia's move to change the visa status for New Zealanders, uh, I think, and it's happened before in the North, those who've got some get up and go will get up and leave. So you've got to consider what's left behind. And so if we don't get things right, people won't come here. They can't get here, they can't operate here, and they'll leave. I might be like a little bit of time. A little bit of time if anyone's got a question. Councillors, do we have any uh, questions? Or... Look, um, Chris, look, I, 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 you have a great submission. Now, yeah, I'm sure it's the same one here, but you've actually expanded on a few more things. Yeah. So it's really great. Thank you very much for that. Really appreciate that. Uh, you've got the time to sit there, as I sit in the audience, and, and listen to other submitters if you'd like. Uh, but thank you very much for your submission. Thanks for hearing me. It's good to be able to come and sit amongst you. Several of you I recognise, and, and uh, you'll see me around town as you do. I'd just like to also, there's a couple of other tribes in town, and you'll get this, Vince. Uh, there's Nati Social Media and Nati AI. 
So you're really going to have to pony up and take a fresh lens to a few things and the influences that are going on, and you've really got to get a lot of things right. And the time to get it right is at the beginning. Because once that train leaves the station, it's much harder to fix. Thank you very much for the exposure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, councillors, we've got a five minute break till our next minute turns up. Um, so if you'd like to stretch your legs, you can. Um, but yeah, we've got five minutes, so 9.35. Yep.
Our next submitter is actually oh, Jenny Plain. You're on. Come on up. You're on volume seven, page one, or in the digital world, page four. I know for many councillors that seems a bit strange, but the way the numbering in the paper goes, it's usually page one is when they turn over your page, but uh, in the digital world we start from the right first page. So, Jenny, once again, you've got five minutes. We encourage you not to read your submissions because we've actually read it, yeah. but to add more information to it. it is. Yep, and I thought you were going to do that. Now what we usually do, uh, Nicolene here is with the bells, so she'll bring it in for four minutes. What we're trying to encourage is that five minutes also includes all of the questions if there's any clarifying questions. Okay, so yeah, we'll give you the time. So councillors, uh, over to Judy, it's all yours. Kia ora koutou. good morning everyone. Today I'm here to thank council for being proactive in cat management in our community and ask for your continued support. You are showing leadership on this issue, encouraging responsible cat ownership and really making a difference. Last year, Council introduced three measures that in combination, global research shows, are the most effective ways of managing cats and reducing the unwanted cat and kitten population. First, by amending the animal's bylaw to include mandatory desex in the microchip of all companion cats by six months old. Second, supporting residents to comply with the new bylaw by employing a cat education and bylaw compliance officer. And third, by contributing $15,000 annually to the Fund ASPCA, tagged specifically for the desexing and microchipping of cats. These measures are working effectively to reduce nuisance in our community, preventing colonies of stray cats forming and helping to protect our native birds and biodiversity. Our Cat Education and Biological Compliance Officer Beverly Dowling provides practical help. When residents find, for example, a mother cat and kittens on their property, she informs them of the new bylaw, provides advice, offers to help with desexing and microchipping, and liaises with the Whangarei SPCA and cat rescue organisations. These unknown cats and kittens may be desexed and microchipped, and some return to the same property or transferred to the care of SPCA or cat rescues. Most local people I've spoken to are thrilled and relieved that finally someone is available to help residents who find abandoned cats and kittens living on their properties. I have got to know Beverly personally. She has many years of experience and a lot of expertise in successfully dealing with cats. Council kindly gave 15000 to our SPCA this year, tag for cat D6 and microchipping. To support this initiative, NZ SPCA added another $33,000 for our community, resulting in 681 snip and chip vouchers available at $30 a cat. These three measures are helping to reduce the burden of unwanted cats and kittens taken to our SPCA. Sadly, 30,000 strand unwanted kittens are brought to New Zealand SPCA centres every year. Some can be rehomed, some euthanized, and some are healthy cats and kittens that are killed because there is not enough one people wanting to adopt them. The increasing cost of cat food and vet bills are contributing factors preventing from people from adopting new pets. Excuse me. To clarify, a stray cat is a cat without a home. It may be friendly, abandoned pet, or semi-wild. Both depend on humans for their survival, or by necessity, predation of native bird and wildlife. Euthanasia ends the life of an animal in order to relieve its pain or suffering. SPC has to kill unwanted healthy animals by necessity. It is simply a case of supply and demand. There are too many cats and kittens needing homes and there are homes available. There are no counter problems to promoting responsible cat ownership, only benefits. Council are reducing a, range, a wide range of nuisance as mandated under Section 145 of the LGA, supporting national legislation on cat welfare and helping to preserve our unique native and insect life. New Zealand Biosecurity estimates that 100 million birds are killed by cats annually. If Council wants to protect and preserve bird life, then proactive cat management is um, necessary. In my submission, I gave an example of a man who's living on $260 a week. He doesn't drive, have access to transport, and is hugely appreciative of council support and be able to slip his chip, his cats for $30 each. When you have so little to live on, your world is small. He doesn't take holidays, go to the beach, cafes or restaurants. His cats are his world, his family, and only reason for getting up every morning. Council is making a huge difference to the lives of people like this man. He has anxiety issues, and getting them fixed has made him a happy person. It has prevented countless litters of kittens, many that either died onto his house or went on to create cat colonies of their own. 
I recently met a lady 19. She had a super friendly, skinny male stray cup turning up on her property to eat her cat's food. She thinks it was left behind by neighbours who moved away. Thanks to council supporting Snip and Chip, this cat was desexed for $30 and I actually brought it home and took it to her this morning. Again, this cat's welfare has caused a lot of anxiety for this elderly lady who has her own health issues to worry about. She told me this morning actually it's affected her blood pressure. So again, I want to thank council for all they have done to help resolve this issue and ask, please, that you continue to employ a cat law by law compliance officer and continue to contribute financially to fund an ASPCA. You are making a huge difference to hundreds of people in our community that you don't even know, which I think is rather wonderful. You're also helping to reduce nuisance, improve cat welfare and protect our birds and unique, unique biodiversity. Manaki te katoa, be kind to all. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Well done for your submission, Judy. And I, again, we have read it, we have gone through it. Is there any clarifying questions from the councillors? No, there's not. Judy, well done again. Very clear, very concise. Thank you. Okay, thank and you you're welcome well to have a seat in the back and listen yeah. to the other submitters if you like. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Our next submitter is Mia Boots. Um, now, this is on volume three. Come on up, Mia. And um, it's page 88 or page 94 in the electronic version. As, as I've said to the other submitters there, this is your five minutes. You've got uh, the bell will ring at four minutes. We try to encourage that if there's any questions that they be done within that five minutes of time. This is your time to talk to you. We, we encourage you not to read your submission, but actually talk to the submission or add extra information to it to help you. So uh, it is cool to go for it. I did my feedback in a hurry. Um, good morning to all of you. Um, the Mayor, the CEO, the councillors. I'm pleased that you're here helping us and also to others. The question I have for councillors are they being totally transparent and open? Council supporting documentation only has only been modelled based on the preferred option at 10.9 in which council states that it's not meant the rates of affordability increases benchmark and are now consulting for a further 3%. Annual inflation is at 7.3. Based on a 3%, that's a 41% increase. This is unreasonable to the ratepayer. It means that councillors simply overspent, borrow this year and place the burden on to the ratepayers for the following next five or ten years. So if the Northland Event Centre requires a new roof and refurbishment, the trust need, must make the decision of how to find those funds. Council may propose a one-off levy from its ratepayers for this purpose. During the 2021 Aruku development consultation, I'd like to remind you 5,000 people responded. 80% of the feedback said nay, nay to 10.5. And you're asking the rate paid for? This itself says a very clear indication that a 3% increase would be and is totally unacceptable. Is it acceptable? The effect of the pandemic shutdowns and the interest rates increases are not only causing Council economic hardships, challenges, it's the homeowner that's been squeezed from both sides. I propose that Council take this into serious consideration. There are difficult decisions to make currently, like when I shop at the local supermarket. And ratepayers are all in that position. As a rate power proposed, there's no more than a 9% increase because we do have a problem 
as I can see by your budget, for, particularly for rolling. So I, I think allocating that first 3% of the 9% increase would be doable. I also have a separate note and a little bit of a bug to be in here with Council, because I attended the Uruku consultation. It was very biased. I actually tried to ask the Chief Executive, was there a parking report? Was there a traffic report? That is a very seriously dangerous part. Was there, was due, due diligence done? Due diligence, I must say, and reiterate, and emphasise to Council and its members, the Mayor and the CEO, that it's necessary for due diligence for you to make a decision. And that also allows you not to waste any money and no consultation time and because you would have our trust. Recently there was a split vote I noted and it appears you, Mr Mayor, Vince, were the deciding vote. Read the Uruku development. A promise of 11.4 million from the ratepayers will have a huge impact. Thus, I strongly recommend Council to reconsider and that it must have a clear mandate from its councillors whom we have elected. I want to thank all of you for letting me speak. Are there any questions? <laughs> that was my next point. Okay. Councillors, are there any clarifying questions for us? Mia. Thank you, Mia. Appreciate the time you've taken to come here. I know we've, we've, you had a book time later on, and I'm glad you're coming early. I uh, really appreciate you coming in and really appreciate you making your submission. Thank you very much. And again, you have the right to sit in the back there and listen to the other submitters as they come through. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Councillors, our next uh, submitter is Debra, and she is on, again, volume 3, page 55, or page 60. One in the electronic version. Good Welcome. morning. Good morning. And, and once again, as I said, you've got five minutes, okay. four minutes available to go. Quite nervous. Take your time. <laughs> You're okay. Don't really like doing this sort of thing, but I really um, feel quite strongly about the percentage you want to put our rates up by. Um, I don't know where, if it's 10.9%, I don't know where I'm going to find the three. Hundred dollars, even the seven point nine. That's um, two hundred and something. Where am I going to find it? Where I've already had to pay an extra five hundred dollars for house insurance, and that's shopping around. Groceries are expensive. Everything is expensive, and it's really hitting everyone's pockets. And I really feel that the council do not look at the projects and um, other ways to save money. Um, so I'm wanting to demonstrate a few examples of that. First one is I get my rates, I pay my rates by recorder, but I get them in an envelope, colour printed. Why is that? So there's nothing on the rates bill to say if you would like it emailed, we prefer to email. I mean you must save at least three dollars a pop with postage, colour printing. That's $12 a year per person. I mean, it's a simple change. I can't people think outside the box and look at other ways of saving money. My next big gripe is with region countdown. Now, the council decided way back to let the region countdown change their access way. They made decisions. They knew countdown was a wrap bag. I've had abatement notices issued and issued and issued. Um, but one of the biggest gripes I had was the council approved a traffic operational management plan that did not actually meet the resource consent condition. I went to that meeting, was quite, um, did not know it had been accepted. The traffic, um, the traffic engineer at the time who reviewed it 
came to the meeting, he was not aware that that plan had actually been accepted in that condition because he did have concerns. It did not meet the resource consent condition, um, which in the end resulted in the council putting in traffic calming on Wild Street by the Regent Countdown Access Way um, up on the intersection of Dennis and Wild Street and on Dennis to try and stop the trucks. So that's an example where the truck is actually turning the wrong way originally. And he's so they've done nothing, and here's the traffic calming put in, and it's done nothing because the trucks are still coming from the wrong way. So that was a complete waste of money. Um, here's the damage big trucks have done to the roads, big tire marks. So I would like council to think about the decisions they make, make proper decisions and look at the long-term cost. I'll actually ask for the cost for the full compliance of this, and I'll be asking for the cost of the islands that we put in. Um, plus, I've had to spend a lot of my time and a lot of stress making sure Region Countdown do the right thing. And I mean, last week they got another three payment notices issued and fines. And their fines are only $750, and they've been complete rat bags the whole time. Um, why can't we find them more when they've continually been bad and they can help pay for it? And the decisions that you just need to look at the long term effect how is it going to actually affect people? Are you going to control it better and manage it better? And there's ways that the council can do this. And that's it. No, I appreciate the submission, Deborah well Wilder. Um, thank you for taking the time. And again, councillors, if anybody any clarifying questions for Deborah? Would you better leave? This is just some of the like, notices that have been issued. When um, the council, when they were doing the development, they actually got, they got them shut down for three months because they, they were didn't um, comply with a lot of the plans, and it was an eight-page abatement notice issued. So here's just some of the examples. Thank you very much for the submission, and thank you for, for highlighting about the uh, emailing of, of uh, rates. That's actually yeah. a very good thing. Reminding me again because we, we have actually had that we put a push out in the past, and yes. uh, we can apologise we haven't done it recently. So yeah. thank you for reminding us. It's all about the little things. Yep. I mean, twelve twelve dollars a year is quite a lot of money to people, and it's something you need to look at. All the little things help. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, you have the right to sit back down there and listen to some of the other submitters. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Our next submitter is Mark. Now, Mark is on uh, volume three again, page 82 or 88 in the electronic version. Welcome, Mark. Thank you again. You've, you've done this many times. You know that you know the protocol. Um, you've got five minutes. Uh, we encourage you, uh, the clean here has a bell for four minutes, but we encourage you to not read the submission but speak to it as, and to highlight anything, anything else you'd like to add. Time is yours. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Two years ago, my presentation at the 10 year plan was treated as a submission. A submission means I get away. You didn't need to take any notice of it. That's why what I've presented today is marked as a notice. My question today is to all councillors who have a moral obligation to serve the people who voted for them and whose money they spend on our rights. Who pulls the strings? Are council controlled knowingly or unknowingly by the World Economic Forum? the World Health Organization and the United Nations, whose agenda 2030, our central government, seems hell bent on following. This agenda includes the ramping up of the sexualizing of our children from birth, as demanded by unelected bureaucrats from the United Nations. 
drag queens, craving an audience of children in our public libraries. Maybe it's taken as a sign that civic leaders condone pedophilia. COVID-19. The US officially declared on May the 11th this year that the pandemic is over. Now that the so-called vaccine trials and emergency use authorization have ended, true science and the horrendous consequences of what are now recognized as no worse than the flu is there for all to see. Councillors may recall my suggestion of two years ago that they look into the findings a reputable, of a reputable international lawyer, Dr. Rainer Fuhlmann, and the German Corona Committee. I wonder how many of you actually did that. Mainstream media are now revealing that Pfizer knew from the beginning that their vaccination would not stop transmission. This came out in an official information request in the US. Why then are MedSAF and our Ministry of Health allowed to promote that jab as safe and effective? This information is a blatant lie. Could we be the carbon they are trying to reduce? The truth is coming. Climate change adaptation and mitigation. Just as the COVID, just as the COVID fear had everybody complying with useless masks, harmful lockdowns, and ineffective vaccines, the recent adverse weather events are working to maintain that fear that CO2 will kill us all. A panel of US experts recently could not answer the simple question I ask everybody. Do you know the percentage of CO2 in the atmosphere? For those that don't know, it's 0.04%, 400 parts per minute. It's clobber the farms. Three waters in the co-governance farce are just the start of central government and hence the United Nations seizing our assets and meeting that goal of the globalists and the World Economic Forum and their unelected leader Klaus Schwab who plan that by 2030 you will own nothing and be happy. Around the world, brave politicians in the European Parliament and even Australian senators are calling for a full investigation into the COVID hoax, not in New Zealand. Our political leaders all signed a pact that they would not talk to the protesters who have a basic human right to hold a difference of opinion to our official government narrative as promoted by the media propaganda. I challenge council, council to immediately establish a committee to investigate these crucial issues, to allow cognitive dissonance to deny the true facts of many of these so-called conspiracy theories is to ignore the glaring evidence that grows daily. I was asked by a well-known doctor at the start of COVID lockdowns what he thought was behind the COVID-19 pandemic, and he replied, controlled by the fourth estate. Soon that fourth estate, bought and paid for, won't be able to keep the lid on the pot, and the people will hold those responsible for promoting and condoning these crimes against humanity <coughs> accountable. I caution counsel that if you do not stand up now, then you are complicit and must be held to account in due course. I thank you for your time. If anyone would like further information from me, come and have a cup of coffee. I'm always available. Appreciate that, Mark, for the submission and, and spending, the, spending the time. Councillors, are there any clarifying questions at all for Mark? No, Mark, there's no clarifying questions, but thank you again for your time. And again, you have the right to sit there and, and, and see, listen to the other submitters as well. I look forward to the comments. Cheers, thank you. <laughs> um, Councillor, our next submitter uh, is Risa. Have I said that right, Risa? Yes. Um, you're on volume 3, page 122, or now version 128. Risa, as I said before, the other, the other submitters, it is your time. You've got five minutes. Uh, four minutes, there will be a bell run. And we try to encourage you to not read your submission, but also, but actually just to highlight more information or to add additional information. Okay?
This is your time to. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, that banging in hair is my knees knocking together with nerves. Um, but I would like to start by saying that I very strongly object to a 10.9% rates increase. Um, it is unaffordable for so many ratepayers. And I would like to, and what I realise that a zero rate increase, is what, which is what we would all like, is not practical. I would like to su suggest that we keep in line with inflation and that rates are kept in line with the rate of inflation, which is fair. Now, the time I feel has come for the Council to acknowledge the debt ridden crisis that it's in, that has been created by many years of overspending and mismanagement. Um, the ratepayers, they have to live within their means, with the money that they have available to them. Um, and this is something that the Council have not done and do not do. Um, and they have not done this for a very, very long time, and this is very obvious by the huge amount of debt that the Council has incurred in recent times. Um, as I see it, and I'm being very simplistic here, we have a group of planners who draw up a wish list of what they would like. And in doing so, they have very little thought given to the costs involved, but that doesn't matter to them because the ratepayers will pay for it, never mind, or else we will create more debt and borrow more money. Um, and also, this is done without consultation to us ratepayers who have to pay for their wish list, which is grossly unjust. Um, however, having said that about the no consultation to the ratepayers for their projects, I'd like to bring, there has been the odd occasion where we have been consulted, which realistically has just been lip service on the part of the council, because you go ahead and do what you want anyway, regardless of what we say. A few examples of this is the yet to be completed very, very fancy, very, very expensive council, new council buildings. This has been overrun. The original price budgeted for this has been overrun by many millions of dollars. Oh, let me, I have to correct that because at a recent meeting I was told these weren't overruns, they were variations. Having been in the contract industry, I know the difference between a variation and a price overrun. When a, when a project like this is costed out, in that cost means is a percentage of the total cost as a contingency fee, fee to cover the cost of these overruns. Well, you just blew that out the ceiling um, with this. And, this, and all, this was all agreed to by the council without consultation to the ratepayers. How is that fair when we are paying for it? Then we have what started out as free waters, which went to 10 waters, and now is some other new fancy name that they're trying to justify themselves. You sold us ratepayers up the river on this, despite the very, very strong opposition to this, you took the government's bribe. You had to. You needed the money to go against the debt that you're in. The most recent example, has already been spoken to here today, is a conference centre that 80% of us voted against. Despite that fact, a number of the councillors, not all of you, voted to go ahead with this project um, and have contributed or have consented to contribute $10.4 million towards it. Where's that $10.4 million going to come from? The ratepayers? Yet another line? You know, let's bury us further in debt. Um, and there will be many more after that 10.4 million, so I don't doubt that. 
one moment. And to those councillors of you who did vote for the, this, we have your names. Don't expect to be voted for next election, because you won't. Um, and councillors, I suggest that you go and talk to the planners, find out exactly what they're planning, because most of you have no idea what they're planning or what they're going on about. Um, you need to talk to us, find out what we want. Take a book, a leaf, out of Gordon Mayer's Wayne Brown's book. He's talked to his ratepayers. He's taking a chainsaw to their budget. You need, and you need to look at the um, budget that you have now. We recently had talks around um, Wongaray um, about this um, budget. How can we discuss a budget when we don't know what it is? Where all the, the spending is hidden under fancy titles and everything else. Where is your transparency? There is none. Or are you just the one source of truth? This today that I'm putting in here is not a submission because I do not submit, I object. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ruth, for your, for your objection. It's fine. Uh, we appreciate you coming in to, to actually talk to us. We appreciate you spending the time to do this. Uh, Councillors, is there any clarifying questions? No clarifying questions. Recent look, you're all welcome to have a seat with the others um, and listen to the rest of the submissions. Thank you very much. Councillors, we're going to move on to uh, Pamela Hodgson. Yes. You're on the volume four, page five, or page seven in the digital world. Uh, look, Pamela, you've, you've got the floor, as you've heard previously, as I've said, people have got five minutes. Four minutes, the will ring a bell here. Uh, we'll try and encourage to have your questions, if there's any clarifying questions within that. And the floor is all yours. We encourage you to not to read to your submission, but actually to talk about it, talk about adding more information to it. All right, well, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Pamela Hodson. Um, I'm um, from the Hikami area. Um, I actually live just off Gomez Road. Um, and I'm here to let you know that I strongly object to the raise in rates. Um, first of all, I want to acknowledge that the Council's budget for 2023 to 2024 um, obviously has been blown already um, and I understand why it is that you want to raise the rates. However, on behalf of the ratepayers, particularly in our area, um, I'd like to say that over the last three years, ratepayers have experienced um, reduced income uh, or in the case of small business owners, they've experienced um, reduced income from their business. Um, a lot of those people are still struggling as a result of that. So now 2023, we're already off to a horrendous start with Gabrielle and the other storms just before, just after. And that's where I understand that a lot of the council's money has got to be redirected to pay for the damage to all the roads. Our road, Gomez Road, is only one of those roads. Um, but of course it matters to us as individuals that our road gets fixed up as well. So while I understand that, I also think that instead of raising the rates and putting even more strain on the ratepayers, what I would like to see you do is reallocate funds that you've already allocated for this 23 24 year um, and put that towards essential spending rather than what I would see as non-essential spending. I think that um, you people would know better than anybody where you can decide what is non-essential and what is essential. For the right players, it's essential that we do not be put on even hard, more hardship by having to pay more money in rates when we're already trying to cover the damage ourselves to our own properties. As far as Gomez Road is concerned, we've got potholes so big in the road 
that we're now using Gomez Road like a one-way road. We're all going right onto one side of the road to, to because we cannot go through these potholes, I so think. Um, work has been done on Gomez Road and we appreciate that, but more work needs to be done. I know that a lot of the ratepayers in Gomez Road um, are very happy to, through their rates, pay a little more additional um, if we could just have our road tar sealed. But we're prepared to do that. Um, but of course, because of the exp expenditure, we understand that it's not going to happen anytime soon. But this is how we want our road to be sorted out. As I say, ours is only one of hundreds, but I'm speaking on behalf of our road. Um, so that's really essentially what I'd like to say is no to reduce or no to um, increase rates um, and please find the money that you've already got um, allocated in the plan for 23-24 and put it into those essential areas that needs to be moved. That's all I have to say. <coughs> Look, I appreciate you coming in and doing the, the submission, Pamela, and, and taking the time. Is there any clarifying questions, councillors? Councillor. Pamela, thank you for coming in. Um, interesting that you talk of sealing Gomez Road. Would there be an appetite for ratepayer funding as part of that? Um, we looked yeah. into it a year or two ago, um, and I think there was a percentage that the council would pay and we'd pay the rest and it could be could be funded over a number of years. I don't know whether the choice was ours as to how many years it would be funded. We our, our rate would increase, you know, to, to pay our, our portion of that. If my understanding is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reed, and thank you, Pamela. And again, as I was told, the other, the other people coming in here, you're more than welcome to, to sit in the, to the audience there and listen to the other submitters uh, for the right to. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to come in. We really, really do appreciate it. Right, councillors, we're now moving on to uh, David's colleague. He's on volume four, page 28, or page 30 in the electronic world. Uh, David, as, as we've told the other submitters, come forward by the way, as the other submitters, you can well sit there or stand, it's up to you. Um, we've got five minutes, four minutes, Nicolene will ring a bell. We try and encourage you rather than to, uh, I see it's only one pager, uh, uh, rather than just read that, just to talk, add more information to it. And uh, as I said, the time is yours. No, thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, when was enough enough? You were wanting a 10.9% percent wage increase. These days that seems particularly excessive. When will these rates rise to cease? How long will the rate be able to absorb, absorb such increases? Have the council even consider cutting their cloth accordingly? Did they do that? What's the rate, what's the interest still going to be this year? 12 million, 15 million, what's it going to be? Why has it been such? mismanagement and incompetence. Not necessarily on your part, but I'm sure there's an element of that for all councils going down the years. If you continue spending excessively, you're going to run the risk of being a lot of disaffected ratepayers. And that doesn't go well for council. People will stop overwriting. I haven't got a lot to else to add because the people before me have said it all. 
we, we people, you know, it ought to be fairly obvious to any person that we're going to be having some fairly serious financial strife in this country and around the world. That's coming. If you don't recognise that, there's something very, very wrong with you. And to impose these kind of increases when these storm clouds are gathering is not good. That's all I've got to say. Please think about it. The cap and cloth accordingly. Thank you, David. I really do appreciate you coming in. Um, is there any questions from the councillors at all? No. Um, David, look, again, as you said to the others, um, other submitters here, you're more than welcome to have a seat at the back there and listen to all the other submissions. Look, I really appreciate your time coming in here. Take the energy to come in here. We really do appreciate it. So thank you very much. Uh, the next submitter is Cornelia, Cornelia Pike. Um, May I just have a question to opt out briefly if you just leave it down? Sure. So, uh, former Councillor Christie, would you like to be able to speak next? Are you okay with that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Your so, your councillors? Your submission. I understand because my brains are on my feet and I think they That's okay. Great. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, just a point, just to point out your, your, your submission's on volume one, page 392 for the councillors. Yes. Uh, the wall read it. Yes. So it's all up to you. Not difficult to read, mine is just no. Uh, I was trying to write some notes, but you asked me to come here about two hours early, and I always got my notes the last hour. However, I did before I start to worship, I just want to recognise uh, the death of Uru Uri. She He was a councillor here from 1989 to 1992. I'm in this chamber, I just want to recognise this. <coughs> Um, as you see, my submission is no to the 10 point whatever it is percent. It is very easy to spend somebody else's money. Times are tough out there and are tougher than some, some of you might well think. As chairman of a school board of a low decile school, I'm dishing out thousands of dollars of food parcels to students in schools. That's not a school day activity, but just to get the kids to school, it's been a burden. That's how hard it is out in some of those communities. We don't see it when we are well off and well healed and got some pay coming in. It's difficult, but those fair percentages, and everybody pays rates some way through their rent or through their rates law. So even if the seven percent one is, is high enough, it appears that you want the other three percent from Cyclone Cable. For my drive around Moray, the damage was mainly trees for over, which somebody did a remarkable job clearing in a very quick time. I would have a guess so half of them cleared by the locals in their local chainsaw. But the damage itself is not as significant as I've seen in other storms. Yes, there will be more storms coming and there will be more frequency, I understand that. But Bola and other storms and Council Hawks, remember, uh, Helena Bay cost us millions of dollars to fix in two years. It's consistently slipping. Uh, storms that you wouldn't have under, uh, storm in 1980 something, uh, all of the beach road at Arai got washed out. So we had to replace all the rock work along them. Today, millions of dollars worth, but that was done within the system. Didn't put the rates up because of it. I have been there where we kept on putting rates up, and that council got completely sacked. Fortunately, I survived. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I always find it is an easy way to find it. I give you some examples. You found six hundred thousand in operating and uh, operating and capital cost. First of all, I see in Council Holtz, once again, Banway, we're pushing a $40 million bellway of capital expenditure in front of us. We haven't spent this. Well, perhaps you might have to just get that done before you start getting the next one on top. It's easy to keep on putting more on. There is a never-ending list that you have to do. 
never ending. There will always be more stuff to do, but keep to the knitting and keep, sometimes you have to keep down to the knitting and cut your cloth for these events. When I was chair of the finance, I, we had a big storm and we could continually talk about the manager and that, what would we do with it? We talked about, do we have a contingency sum? No, it was just going to be a slush fund spent. Do we, what do we do with the house or do we actually put a special rate on? As time went on, we never put a special rate on, we managed to supply within. In one year, the chair of finance at that time had seven million dollars in surplus in operating costs, took seven million dollars out of operating costs and nobody other than a few staff complained. No drop in service, nothing. During the amount of motion, we dropped 200 staff and increased services, nobody noticed, didn't have a rate rise for about six or seven years, people say, well, it's too, too long. But remember, we were making some gains, 30 to 40 percent gain out of amalgamation. So why would you want a rate rise? People forget about that. So it is so easy to spend that money and make it an easy way out. So I'm saying to you, look with internal, find the cost internally, and take cut your cloth and make it accordingly. Just one other thing is your Transport Alliance Group. That was formed approximately 10 odd years ago with the key of saying, at their sold to councils, that it's going to make a 30 million, 34 million dollars, I remember rightly, saving over the 10 year period. You ask them how efficient you are now. I bet you that $30 million was never saved. And we've probably got more staff going doing what we did without them. And while I'm saying that, this council at one stage was sealing 35 kilometres of road a year for seven years. That is 10 or 12 contracts sealing 3Ks each. So that's 10 contracts at a year, 3Ks each over a seven or eight year period. No increase in staff, got the job done, all on time. So, and I'm wondering now if the Transport Alliance, if you give them that target, they'll come up with every excuse why they couldn't do it. <coughs> but somehow, so we always talk about productivity, and you notice that the, the see that New Zealand is one of the lowest in productivity. I don't understand why when we just put so much procurement, so much procedure, so much everything else in front of the system to slow it down. Now I'm in that same trade, I'm in that health and safety trade, and the amount of time to put fences up, I have absolutely no idea. Four councils as well, charge of the earth, they blow me, I'll get paid for it. And they sit there for months and months and months. And I get my pay for the and it comes. So we are very easy to spend that money without looking for efficiencies and gains in the system. And I'm saying it's there, and if you can't find it, just trim your cloth to make it fit. And that's what it is. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I don't have to think anymore now. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> appreciate you coming in. Uh, is there any clarifying questions for Craig? Right. No, quite a bit. You're, you're relieved of a duty. You're more than welcome to have a seat at the back there again with the others. I must admit, this is the first time I've been in this council chamber at a time. At a time. <laughs> <laughs> You've done well. Um, our next submitter is John Clark. He's on uh, volume four. Is John here? Yes, come on in, John. Um, the submission process, as you may not have heard from the previous, as I was saying, you've got five minutes. Uh, the time is yours. We encourage you not to read the submission, but talk to it and add any other information that you'd like to add to it. Um, we allow the time of the five minutes to also include any clarifying questions from the councillors. Uh, your submission is on volume four, page 33 and page 35 in the electronic world. So it is over to you, John. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> um, I, I will prefer to read it, but I have some side notes about it. Uh, at the top of the feedback page we have the two options. And my first comment I'd make with option two 
stick with the 7.9% rate increase. Surely when you did that for the long-term plan, there was an annual inflation cost built into that. If there wasn't, then that was seriously an act of the council not to have included that in the plan. It's the first point I'd like to make. <laughs> Following COVID and the ongoing disruptions in New Zealand and business costs in general, plus the cost of inflation and the impact of various weather events, particularly in the North Island, now is the time for prudent decisions, whether it be small, medium or large companies, or our own Monterey District Council. Yes, the District Council is running a business on behalf of ratepayers and residents. Now is not the time for committing funds to a wish list, which in particular is anything that is not core business. And to, to indicate uh, some of the press releases we've seen, that something like the Aruku um, proposal um, to be built under another entity name or under a so-called trust is misleading rate buyers to the extreme extent. We've seen that with um, the Hundawasa. We've seen a, a group of people um, who were very um, strong in their vision and power to them, but the council have ended up with a debt they've had to cover because of that. So it needs far more prudent planning than as we've seen in the past. Many businesses in the Monterey District Council area are struggling financially, and so too are the people. The families who live in and support this area as best they can. To propose a 10.9% increase is both foolish and disrespectful to the citizens you serve. If it was imperative to increase general rates by 10.9, and I say imperative in a, in a capital letters, Surely if you would propose 10.9 to survive, the Bomberry District Council would be saying this is the case, rather than put up two options. I want to make that point very clearly. <clears throat> yes, we have had a torrid time with inflation and cost blowouts, etc. Yes, Bomberry District Council has had to spend 800000 for Hundabasa to prop it up this year. Whether you like the building or not, the District Council may well have to put in another 800,000 this current year. I see someone shaking their head, but we've seen nothing to say otherwise. This has been, has this been budgeted for for the coming current year or the following year? If you have to put another 800,000 to prop it up again, rather than close the doors. Baruku Landing is not a must have at this time, no more than a business that would like to buy some new expensive machinery that maybe will improve profit. Other capital works plans must be carefully critiqued. As your worship will know, I have always been a strong supporter of the Bomberry District Council in this region. I have also strongly supported the District Council's stance against three waters and the huge negative impact it would have on the Bomberry District Council and the citizens. New Zealand is in the clutches of post-COVID, inflation, possible world recession, and a huge need for a greater workforce from unskilled to professional people throughout the country. Again, this is a time for caution and to look after the needs of our Honorary District Council community. It is not a time for monuments that, under the cat that fall under the category of wants. I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. <coughs> Appreciate that, John. Any, any clarifying questions from councillors? No, John, thank you again. Appreciate your time coming in. Look, it's a big thing coming in and doing submission. I know it's sometimes a bit nervous, but you did very, very well. And look, again, as I say to the other people, look, you're more than welcome to sit at the back deals with the others as they come through. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, our next person is Cornelia Pike. Is she back in? Yes, come on up. Uh, Cornelia, as, as you've heard before, as I said, uh, you've got five minutes, so feel free to use the five minutes. Your submission is on uh, volume eight, page 37. So uh, we encourage you not to read the submission, but talk to it and highlight anything extra that you'd like to add. Um, within that five minutes, you'll get your, any questions that you possibly be asked. Uh, and at four minutes, the will ring them down. Okay, so it's over to you. Okay. Uh, I can only agree with what the gentleman before me said. He said it very well. I never believed that uh, Wunderkwasa is going to be this magic um, project that's going to save us for lots of tourists. 
Uh, but you know, and now we're facing the same problem with the Uruku landing and possibly a new airport. And I don't agree in a time like this that we need to spend money on nice fancy buildings. Uh, I'm already quite annoyed that you got like I never heard about the new council building. Um, and that leads me to the next point about communication. I'm sure there's a way that you can send us a little piece of paper regularly within uh, when we get our uh, rate invoices. Um, and I went along to the Nunguru um, meeting and I was appalled how many locals turned up have been living there 30 years. And I was wondering where is everybody? If the areas are growing so fast, and I see it all the time, where, where's all the people? So where's the problem? You know, investigate, uh, because sometimes I feel if you put out public meetings or whatever, and then only a few handfuls turn up, and then you take that as, oh yes, the public didn't say much or didn't turn up or something, and you, you base your decisions on, on that. So, uh, and, and even with the three waters, you know, if, if six or seven or if it's half, that's not majority. You know, so I, I really um, think you, you should improve your communication and consultation ways with the, with us as ratepayers. You you're our servants, and and we would like you to act on what you say. And and people have enough. Truly, people are squashed and, and squeezed uh, to the maximum. And we don't have enough time for our children anymore because we're having to make ends meet. And we just sit them in front of a computer or a laptop and, 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 and that's it. And they don't start thinking, we need our young people here too. You know, we're old fashioned, we got old traits and all that. We could survive if, the, if stuff happens, but they're young people. How can we engage them more, you know, in what's happening? Um, so that's another thing. And I uh, want to. Uh, uh, Say yes, we've got far too much bureaucracy. It's all talk, not enough action. Um, we, as people, have a lot of common sense. We don't need to be studying people to clearly see if where we're heading and what needs to be done. And um, papers just get shuffled around, and applications, and we need another consultant to, to check this up. When overseas studies already have proved lots of things, and all this. That stuff, you know what I mean? Hands-on things need to happen, you know? We, council used to have their own um, gang to look after the parks and everything. Everything gets contracted out. Then you get the contractors getting subcontractors, so they clip the ticket again. You know, it, it, it's just enormous how much money gets wasted and, and not enough work done. And how, the, how about the most fundamental needs as human beings is housing. Where we, how much further do you want to push these houses, house prices up? If you put your rates up, that means uh, the, the little people at the bottom will have to pick up the pieces again by getting their rates raised. Another thing is taxpayers pay, subsidise these high rates for all our people who need, you know, social welfare or whatever. It's us, that, you know. And the water. We need to hold on to our water assets and our water. China will come along and sell us the water soon if the things go the way they are. We need to hold on to what little we've got left. And I urge you all to listen to a 12-year-old girl that I came across the other day and spoke in Rio at a UN uh, conference, Earth Summit, in 1992. That's 30 years ago. It gives me the goosebumps to listen to this brave 12-year-old speaking in front of all these delegates. And she said it very clearly that, um, what are we missing, you know? And, and, and I would love to read you out the whole thing and I'll start till my time is up. I like to start reading a thing. It was read by Severn, please make a note, Severn Colors Suzuki. I want you all to go home it's a five minute speech and I want you to look at the faces of the of the get delegates there and see if there's anything that touches your heart and wake up, basically. Because nothing has changed of what she's saying in these 
five minute speech about environment, we're still spraying toxins, we're not listening to our local toxins group. I know how hard it is when, you, when you're in a group and you want to uh, change things. You give all your own private time, energy and resources. We're not getting paid. And we go there months and days and weeks and years and nothing changes. We need to stop and really think what we're actually doing. Instead of going along with governments, listening to our governments, they listening to the WHO, the health, wealth, World Health Organization and the World Economic Forum, which is all bullshit, self-appointed people like Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab. If you haven't heard about them, please educate yourself. This is serious stuff. And we've got to wake up. We've got to be self um, our communities need to organize themselves. We don't need the government for everything to tell us where it's going. Because they're not listening. Nobody's listening. It's all about profit and greed and control and power. You know, and the families are suffering. It's deteriorating. More violence, more crime. It's, it's so obvious. You know, and I, I, I know that it's, it's, we are in bureaucracy and all that, but I think, I believe we all can do better. You know? And I hope you really truly listen to this girl because I thought she was amazing and how relevant it is still today. Just blows me away. And actually it's got worse, much worse. And we think we've got smartphones and smart TVs and we're smart and we're not smart. We're digging our own grave basically. We carry on like this. There's no more hope in the future for our grandchildren and great grandchildren. We all got a really serious responsibility here to act. And, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, and before I start, I know I've got enough copies, but I do want you to realise how much work and effort people put into these things, and, and I don't know how many of you actually end up reading that stuff. It is serious. So I say, that Lena will probably do this for you if you'd like. She's... Oh, that's all right. Yeah, I only had a couple, but anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again, Helena. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to come in and appreciate you doing the submission. And, and again, is, uh, is there any questions, Helena? No. We, look, again, thank you very much. Yeah. You're more than welcome to back doing some of the other submissions. Okay? Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, Ellen Palmer now on volume 1, 2, 11, page 2, 11. Ellen, the time is yours. You've, you've heard me say the, all, all, the, all the rules and the, the stuff, but by all means, this is your time. Take your time and, 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 and just um, talk to you soon. Sure. Te whare tu me, te mara ki waho tēnā kōru, tēnā mate o te wā. Hairi, hairi, hairi. Very good. In our Tira, 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 Tena Kato, Iwi Kaira, Tena Kato. For my submission today, I brought this Taola, this bone carving, and this magnificent Toko Toko, because it was presented to me in this very room in 1988 um, by the then City Council and the Northland Community Trust, which was the then governing body of Forum North, given to me an acknowledgement of the work I'd done as Director of Forum North in the previous five years, and particularly for the establishment of Northland Youth Theatre. Now, I'm running against the grain here, because I'm saying to Council they should not be taking the lower rate. Sorry about that, everybody. But what will happen is things will get cut, but I can guarantee that one of the easy targets that will get cut are the arts. And the Fundraiser District Council has a very, very poor record of supporting the arts. When this council was established back in the early 90s by then the amalgamation of the city and the county councils, that very quickly after that defunded the Fundraiser Community Arts Council and disestablished the Forum of Trust and took direct, direct control of this building. Um, it did that without, consulta without consultation. It realised at the time that in doing that it would lose the youth theatre because the youth theatre was actually part of the Forum North activity. It was run by the Forum North Trust, it had administration by the Forum North Trust, 
it had its annual seasons in this building. It was completely run by that, by that trust at that time. And so the council realising that it was going to lose the, um, the, the youth theatre, which it thought was a valuable asset to this town at the time, it was actually receiving national funding from the National Arts Council. It was doing annual seasons of four or five plays through the summer in this building. There were about 70 or 80 kids were coming down here from all over Northland and in fact from all over the country, obviously, living in the hostels, at the schools, rehearsing every day for four or five weeks and putting on these plays, which were directed by established professionals like Don Selwyn, Sonny Amy, uh, Sam Scott, and many others. So it had a fantastic reputation, and the council could see that losing that would be a bad thing. So it asked people who were involved with the youth theatre at the time to form a trust for the youth theatre. It gave them $25,000 to go away and find, this, find a place to live, an office if you like, to pay an administrator, and then to find somewhere to do its performances. And then it had the cheek to ask for $10,000 from the youth theatre to use for a north for its performances. Couldn't afford that, obviously. So 30 years later, this council is still paying the youth theatre $25,000. It's starving to death. It's just moved again. And uh, it can't do the work that it was doing in the past. It's not having the effect. You're actually wasting your money at the moment by giving you that money. You need to double that money. The other thing, of course, that needs to happen is that this, this, this building needs to be given back to the community. You really stole it from the community, not you individually, I'm not criticising anybody here individually, but this institution, this council, um, you know, stole this from the community um, and has been squatting here ever since because you're holding this community in trust for the community. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the community. You have a deed of trust that you're supposed to be running this place on behalf of this community. You're failing in that duty and you need to make sure this, this facility goes back to the community when you move out of here. Um, so, um, you should do some research, actually, on your, on your art strategy. Um, it's a good strategy, very comprehensive. It was supposed to be updated a year ago. You need to go back to it. You need to look at the things that you are intending to do using Creative Northern. I'm not sure if you're aware that Creative Northern only exists because uh, when Craig Mayer was, um, was, was the mayor, when Craig Brown was the mayor, uh, he was confronted with the things that this, this, the council had done to the arts community in this town. And we had a legal case against the council at the time. He agreed to set up a trust which became the Arts Promotion Trust. Phil Holtz was a member of that trust at the time. Um, and um, that's now morphed into Creative Northland. So you need to make sure that you're funding Creative Northland to the extent that they can do the work that you've asked them to do as part of your strategy. Otherwise, you know, nothing will happen. And if you cut your, your, your rates, again, nothing will happen. We'll go backwards as we did for many years under the, in, in, the, in those early days with these cuts. And it does nothing to the town but destroy the soul of the town. It's harming your youth because they're not benefiting from the things that you're trying to fund. And you, you know you need to just take care. And and it doesn't. It would be it would, the, the funding that's required to make this town buzz and hum is so little compared to what you're paying on all those other things that these people here see you're spending, you're wasting your money. This would not be a waste of money at all. So I urge you to do that. So my my submissions are, just get this, just so you've got it clear, is that you, um, excuse me. Right. Uh, you, should, you, should, you should move, when you move from the foreign facilities, they should be returned to the community. The council should at least double its annual grant to NYT. And council should review its art strategy to ensure sufficient funding is ongoing to achieve the targets and outcomes in that strategy. Thank you. Uh, Alan, thank you again for your submission. Thank you for coming in at the time. I know it's a big thing coming in and, and making something. Um, and it's been such a while since I've seen you in here, so it's great to see you in here. Um, any questions for Councillor? Can, can, can I just say that I'm actually standing here as an individual. I've got no association with Youth Theatre these days at the moment. Um, they have their annual uh, annual general meeting tonight. I might go and myself to be on the board. I've had no 
no direct uh, association or, or, or activities with youth here for quite some time. I am a member of the Forum North Trust 2013 that will be submitted later, but I'm not speaking on their behalf, I'm speaking as an individual here today. No, we appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Uh, uh, Councillor Peters has a question, a um, clarifying question. Yes, uh, what in your opinion uh, would be a good relationship um, between Creative North and the Forum North Trust number one? Forum of Trust 2013. Yeah. So what was well, the Forum Trust in, in terms of managing this? Yes. Yeah. The Forum of Trust, you know, the, manage, the management of this facility for the community is a job in itself. I mean, when I was when I was director of Forum North, I had a wonderful relationship with the community arts council at the time, and we would do joint activities and we would work together. For, for instance, I, you may not be aware, but we had the first buskers festival in New Zealand way, way back. The buskers came and they lived in Forum North, down in the Te Kotahi Danga Hall. Um, that naming of that hall, I might say, was a very significant moment for this, for this building, Te Kotahi Danga. The local uh, Kamata used to came in because we were using the building for um, activities, educational activities and having cross-cultural programs in the building. Kids would come and live in Marais style in here. And those Kamata came in here and they gave it that name, which is the meeting place of all people. It's a very significant name, this building. It was the meeting place of all people. It's not the meeting place of all people now. And as you can afford to pay $1,500 to hire that theatre, and well, nobody in this community can, do, can afford to do that, I can assure you that. And so, um, you know, it's ridiculous what you've got. You know, you've, you've actually lost your community. So the relationship with people would work together to create activities in this town, having, a, having an art centre. Because this is our art centre, we don't have that anymore. We've taken it away. We want to give our art centre back, and we can create arts activities together, which will then, they used to call it the pumping heart of this community, pumping energy out there all the time. We had a trolley, we had a trolley derby down down Back Street years ago. It was fun, lots of fun, and uh, and kids were enjoying themselves, not going around smashing houses and, or smashing, um, you know, shops and stealing stuff. So. You know, there's a lot we could do with a little. A lot we could do with a little. Because we've got the resources here if you give them back. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you again, Ellen. Um, you, you, I don't know if there's other questions now. Ellen, you, again, I've said to the other, other submitters that you have the right to sit there and, and listen to the other submissions as we come through. We'll be back later with the Foreign Law Trust. Absolutely <laughs> not a problem at this stage, totally. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Uh, now, the next letter is actually uh, Frank Newman. Now, Frank, I've seen you've got two here. Will you be speaking on the Roxy Northland or is it individual? Which one are you going to speak first? Democracy Northland first. Okay. And then I'll switch to my own personal submission. Okay, no problem. So, just so the councillors to understand, uh, the Democracy Northland submission, the Northland submission is on uh, volume 7, page 14, or page 17 in the electronic world. So, uh, Frank will be. I'll look at it and put some, some documents in there. Frank, you, you've heard me do the spiel before to the other councillors, and again, uh, I acknowledge that as a former councillor, it's great to see you in here as well, as I did with Councillor Christie. Um, again, I, 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 you've heard me say it before, you've got five minutes, you've got that time. Uh, we'll, we'll try and divide, make sure we do your individual <coughs> next after that, okay? So we'll try and get them together. Sure. Um, thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Councillors, for the option for today. A lot of places. Um, Democracy in Northland. Um, John, Bain, and Robin would have actually, Robin Free would have been delivering today. They can't be here, so they've asked me to stand in the court. Um, I guess it's fair to say that Democracy in Northland is disappointed that the Council has not been, has not done more to um, solicit or receive the views of the public. Um, we believe it's not good enough to simply comply with the statutory requirements of consultation. We believe the council should have actually done more. Um, we believe it should have gone out and asked the public what it believes is a fair and reasonable rate increase, ranging from 0% through to your 10.9% option. We believe the second question actually should have been asked and that is, once they establish what they believe the fear rate increase would be, 
to uh, give Council a steer on the, on the priorities, whether it be roads, uh, as Ellen has suggested, or other priorities, so it guides you guys as to where you think the spending needs to be. Because obviously, budgeting exercise is all about setting parameters and setting priorities of spending within those parameters. Our feeling is the Council keeps simply expanding the parameters without actually doing the difficult stuff of setting priorities. Um, as I say, we're disappointed Council didn't go out and ask those questions, so we did. Uh, we went out and polled them, and I've just produced the results to you here today. So for the rest of my Democracy Northern submission, I will simply go through and report the results of the survey we did. So essentially we went and asked people, what do you think is a fair and reasonable rate increase? We gave them 11 options to choose from, ranging from 0%, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 8, 9, 10.9. So we gave them 11 different options to choose from. So, and then we gave them an opportunity to comment. Um, and what I've done is I've appended um, a range of comments to give you an indication of what people are thinking. And attached to that is also the answer they scored. So if they said 0%, you can see what the 0% people are saying. And if they said 10.9, you can see what the 10.9% people are saying. So I'm just going to deliver to you the overall result. The overall score was 3.4%. So that's what the community at large think is a fair and reasonable rate increase in today's environment. Um, 277 people have responded to the poll as of last night. Uh, just from a statistical point of view, that means it's got a 5.6% margin of error. And I'll explain that a little bit later why that's relevant. In fact, the results are so compelling that the margin of error is largely irrelevant in my view. It wouldn't make any difference if we've got a thousand responses, results will be the same, given what the results are. Um, so basically 5% um, was the most popular score. 27% um, of the respondents said 5% would be a fair and reasonable increase. Um, the next one was 25% said zero. And basically they're saying that you guys have got to cut costs, live within your, within your means, and there's a lot of wastage within the spending. That means you can take it down to zero percent. And obviously with people thinking there, Haruku Landing, Hundavasa, you know what the keywords are. Uh, in fact, um, I may talk about that in my personal submission page. Um, 6% and 3% was the next most important response. I think the, the key result is actually on page 2, and if I, if I can direct you, to, direct you to the graph on page 2, because what I've done is just banded it and said, well, how many people said between 0 and 3%? That was 47%. How many said between 4 and 6%? 49%. And how many people between 7 and 10%? And 10.9%? That was 4%. So your two options, and you only offered people two options, 7.9 and 10.9, only 4% believe that is fair and reasonable. Most people said between 4 and 6%. So from a practical point of view, what does that tell you? Half of the population out there that you represent and you trusted in October to elect you, we're asking you to trust them because they're saying between 4 and 6%. You want to pull a figure out of, the, out of that? 5%. That's really what it is. Half the same. 5% is a fair and reasonable rate increase. Now, you don't have to look too far to see um, that that is, probably is a fair increase because you just need to look at Kaipra. They were facing a plus 10% rate increase. They reviewed their budget, they cut off, they deferred $10 million in capital spending and their rate increase is now 5.3. In fact, they think they'll get it lower. So, you know, I think the signs are pointing in one direction, aren't they? Um, really, just in conclusion to this, the, the, your 10.9% is well outside of what the public think is fair and reasonable. You've got to accept that, and you're getting that feedback. You should have gone out and asked them what is fair and reasonable, but they're telling you it's not 10.9, it's not 
It's around 4 to 6% is fair and reasonable, and quite a few are so annoyed at what you're doing, they're saying zero. They're saying stop the wastage because they themselves in their own budgets, that's exactly what families are doing today. They're cutting costs. So setting priorities, it's called budgeting. <laughs> There's just one other thing I wish to conclude for this part of the session. Um, you guys have said you've gone through and done a very comprehensive review, found $640,000 worth of savings out of a budget of $320 million. That's 0.2%. That's pathetic. Sorry to be so blunt, but it's pathetic. I would say you haven't looked hard enough or you haven't had the right people looking. So, we suggest you guys put up an independent, um, do an independent review under the guidance of your Chairman of the Finance Committee and get independent people in there to review your costs because I'm damn sure you'll find five to ten million dollars pretty easily and that will deliver the savings that the community is now demanding of you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I'll just check if any questions. Any questions at all? No on that one? No? Okay, Frank, we're up over to your individual, which is on, uh, for the council to understand, it's on uh, volume 5, page 21 or 24. You guys are not asking me any questions today. I think, I think they're all listening, uh, Frank, so they're listening to what the, the people have got to say. Well, I hope you guys are listening because you haven't listened so far. This is my personal submission. The community is actually fed up with you guys because you haven't listened. On a Ruka landing, for example, they said 80% said no, and then you revisited that and you had allocated $10.4 million for next year, for 2025. Well, all you're really doing is kicking the problem into the future. And that's what this council is doing all the time. You're not setting priorities. You're saying, oh, we're going to borrow some money to do it. And borrowing money doesn't cost anything, does it? No, of course it doesn't. It doesn't affect rates. Well, yes, it does. Capital spending does affect rates. 82% of your rating money goes towards capital projects. It's not free. You're spending money, right? Let's just make no mistake about this rate increase. You know, it's going to affect everyone. 10.9% is a lot. It's a lot of money, especially for a business. Your business differential is what, 4.7 times? Many thousands of dollars, and you're going to increase that by 10.9%. How do you think that affects businesses, the ones that are still suffering from COVID, the cafes, the hospitality industries? How do you think they're going to feel about this? What about normal households that are suffering that are on fixed incomes? And last I saw, there were about 40% of our population on fixed incomes. How are they going to feel? They haven't had a 10.9% rate increase, have they? So you're asking them to take money from somewhere else to give to you so you can spend on your pet projects. Because you haven't set priorities. Because you want to spend, for example, $729 on a feasibility study for an airport out of rural Tongata that may not take place for 20 years. Why are you doing that? You're saying that's more important than taking money out of people's budget? No way. No way. You want to put it 11.4 million or is it 10.4 million for a roof on the event centre? You're saying that's more important than deferring that for a year or two? You don't have to defer it for a year or two, you want to do it now, and that's more important than people putting food on the table. No way, guys. No way. You have got to set priorities like everyone else. And it's not unreasonable for the people to demand that you do that, because it's exactly what they're doing themselves. It's simply not credible for you guys to say you could only find $640,000 in savings. And I'll tell you what really annoys me. Out at Nungaroo, um, Alan and others stood up and said, we've done well, we've saved $640,000. And this council, a day later, a day later, you actually increase the budget. You don't decrease it because you spend money on the town hall. Is it five million? Is it? You've added to the budget. 
that we are discussing. So while, we are, while you're consulting on the 2024 budget, you're actually increasing the budget by $5 million. Let's hope I've got that right, I'm pretty sure I have. <laughs> so you've actually increased the spending. You haven't saved 640, you've just increased it by five million. What are you talking about? How bad is that? It is absolutely unacceptable. It's disgusting. And what's it going to be next year? Because let's think of what's coming up. Three waters is coming up, isn't it? Well, that's going to take about $40 million out of your, your uh, reserves that you've used for internal borrowing because you'll have to pay that to the government. You also, you won't have the five million or so in overhead that you're recovering from your water charges. You're going to have to recover that from someone else. Where's that money going to come from? Five million is about 4% of your rates. The 10.4 million on Ruka Landing is about 8%. I can just see 12% rate increase coming up next year. And that means that you need to be frugal today because you've got some hits coming next year that you haven't told people about. You know exactly what the cost of three waters is going to be, but have you disclosed that? Not a word. You haven't told anyone what's coming up. If you were to tell people that there's 15% coming up next year because of this, this and this, they'll say, well, you better start saving today because I'm finding 10.9 bad enough and I certainly don't want 15 next year. So you better give people a warning about what's coming up because you haven't, and it's your responsibility to do so. I think the only reason, the other thing about the number of meeting is that we were challenged to come up with ideas as to where savings can be made, and I've simply offered a few to you today. It's actually unreasonable to ask us to come up with ways to save. That's your job. What we need, the only thing we need to tell you is what we think is fair and reasonable. We give you the budget. You have to work within the budget and set the priorities. I'll give you an example. Your um, operating expenses of $200 million. There's $93 million there called other. That's it. That's a description, other. How do, how do we know what the hell's going on in that $93 million? Are you telling us you can't find any savings in the other $93 million? It's got to be heaps. But we can't come up with the suggestions unless you give us the answer. I'm assuming you guys have been given the answer, the detail, so you can come up with the answers. But it's unreasonable to ask us to come up with answers when you haven't given us the detail. I think that pretty much fits the main point. Appreciate that, Frank. And, and again, I, I do say again, it's, it's great to have more councillor in here and uh, put the submission in. It's actually really good. Uh, is there any any questions? No, I'm even checking for our finance person on, on the video link. There's no question from him either. Frank, look again. It, I do say really good having you come in. Really good having you, having this submission here. The councillors are listening. They are listening to what, what all, all people are saying here. So it's all part of that whole process we take into account, okay? Good, thank you. Thank you, councillors. And you're welcome you're well, to have a seat here. Thank you. Councillors, we've now got uh, Nora. Nora, yep, yep. Uh, you're, you're coming up. Now, you've also got two submissions. So I, I, we're doing the individual one first. No, I'd like to do that on the Right, just making sure of that. So for councillors, that's on volume six, page seven, in the electronic book, or page five for those who are still with books around. Uh, Laura, it's over to you. you and you've heard how I've introduced previously. Yes, you have. Yep. yep, so. I will have to read off my notes every now and then because I've got a lot of calls up in here. I tend to get confused with the That's okay, no, no, it's okay. Yeah, I'm just quickly outlining the issue at hand again, which is the continued accidental exposure to of the public and specifically children to toxic herbicides in roadside spraying um, by council contractors. The every chemical spray application rules are defined in the Northland Regional Council's air quality plan. The NRC standards are in alignment with the national standards, however, they are not in alignment with the global standards. 
In New Zealand regulations, schools are listed under sensitive areas. In our understanding, this constitutes a legally binding definition of children being spray sensitive, regardless of the classification of the chemicals in use. The definition of sensitive is readily or excessively affected by external agencies or influences. Yet when children leave their schools, this status is seemingly not extended on their way home. They are in fact the people most at risk. Virtues and sidewalks are typically sprayed in, at working hours and therefore the risk of accidental exposure to children is particularly high. And typical for Kiwi kids, they walk in their feet. And many of them for extended um, periods on, on the verges and sidewalks to reach their parents' cars or home. By now we have three accidental exposure of children to pesticides brain by council contractors, which have been officially reported. But many more people who don't want to be named have contacted us. In October 21, we reported an incident on Mill Road, which you should all be aware of, and you would have seen that the photos. We were told at the time that WDC and NTA has discussed this incident in a meeting, but the operator vehemently denied the allegation. Given that NTA as a contracting agency would have to declare a conflict of interest, um, Calvin Thomas appropriately um, commissioned an independent investigation of this incident which was to encompass recommendations on how to avoid such incidences in the future. A draft report was submitted by the investigator and um, sent for, uh, to NTA for a review on the 15th of December 22, so quite a long time later. I asked Mr. Barron, the director of this company, last month of the status of the investigation and he said NTA has not replied to them and therefore the PIS report could not be completed. In March 21, NTAG had made a submission to the long-term plan of both WDC and NRC asking for an immediate moratorium on all agrochemical um, herbicide spraying and roadside management in public places management and public places. This was undersigned by 75 people. Our submission contained solutions and references to scientific information. We also offered to connect WDC with experts in this field. NRC Councillor Jake Craw, ex-biosecurity manager of Auckland and author of the weed management policies for parks and open spaces, and offered to conduct workshops for WDC on integrated weed management. Last year, I established through an official information request that neither WDC nor NRC has even tabled this issue in any of their meetings. And that is seriously disappointing, to say the least. Given the responses we received and the lack, or the lack of, of response, and the lack of remediation experienced, it appears that safeguarding children from accidental exposure to toxin is not of urgency to WDC, but it is to us. I would call it negligence. Since we've experienced how council operates, we feel the need to speed this process up in order to protect the public. We ask WDC to present us with a written commitment to a moratorium in four weeks' time. Otherwise, we will take this much higher. You have all now received um, the letter of support from the Hapu uh, Iwi Trust, which came in last night. They say it very clearly. People don't want to be poisoned anymore. You had over two years to discuss this issue, to bring it up in your meetings, and to mandate um, operational to make moves towards integrated roadside management. You haven't done this. 
So we ask you in four weeks' time to present us with a written commitment. Thank you, Nora. As Nora, is there any questions for Nora? No questions, no? Okay. Would you like to move on to your individual submission? Sure. It's, um, I'll, I'll spare you the repetition, but I would like to say something about democracy since that's what I've experienced the lack of when we were working on this issue for nearly 16 years. First, I really would like to see a compulsory automatic replies for all emails from everyone, the, the staff, the, the councillors, everyone who works for councils in general, not just WPC, NRC, because we are left in the dark whether we have received our emails or not. And the common behaviour seems to be first uh, slow to respond or no response as long as possible then deny that there is an issue as long as possible and then pass the buck, pass the buck, pass the buck. <laughs> and I think that's simply not acceptable. You know, you are our representatives. If you don't want to listen to us, I find this, you know, just not acceptable. So, uh, that's um, improving local democracy. Important consultation, and that was touched on before, should be advertised much better than, than you always do. It's, it's not, you know, I turned up at the long-term plan consultation of NRC. You know how many people were there? What? Me. That's, you know, and they said, so how, how do you propose we do this? Cornelia said it earlier on, you know where to get us when you want our rights, where you can send us a letter to that address. We have no excuse to say, but people, you know, we put it in the paper. Nobody reads the paper, it's just propaganda. <laughs> then the other thing, and that's in regards to protecting the environment, most people don't seem to be aware that we do have regulations, environmental regulations. Um, I've suggested to NRC as well that uh, with the annual um, rates there should be a brochure, it can be in digital format, so we don't require New Zealand. Um, with the basic rules like don't burn plastic rubbish, you have to keep your dog under control, on your property, and so on. I mean, there's, there are rules, but most people actually aren't aware of it, because they wouldn't call council and ask, am I allowed to burn plastic rubbish? Of course they won't, they just do it. So, you know, if you want to protect the environment, and if you certainly do, you need to tell people what they're allowed and also what their rights are, that they can pick up the phone and make a complaint about a neighbor who's burning plastic rubbish. So, really, that's um, what I can say about democracy. I think that most governments in this world won't even know how to spell the word these days. Um, and I found that, yeah, very disappointed that I stood here last time at the long-term plan consultation and said exactly all these things and nobody did anything about it. And I'm not talking about something trivial here. We're talking about the health of the public. We're talking about the environment. And that's part of climate emergency too, because pesticides have a huge impact on the climate. People forget that. And I also would like to point out New Zealand has the most polluted waterways of all of the developed nations. That is a shame. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do this submission. I appreciate your individual one as well. Councillors, are there any questions for Nora? No, no questions. Nora, look, your head submission has been listened to. Please be well aware of that. We are listening here. Even though we're not asking questions, we, we are actually listening. So, look, if you'd like to sit with the others, you're more than welcome to, um, and hear the rest of the submission. But thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, Councillor we're now going to move on to uh, Friends for Gomez Road. I think they're coming up. Um, Mr. Kevin Hodgson again. Hodgson, sorry, again.
uh, on volume one, page four and five. Pamela, you're, you're more than welcome to, you know the procedures, you know what we've done, so it's all yours. Uh, thank you. I was, when I was coming in this afternoon to talk about this, I'm a little bit on the back foot. Um, so, I also represent a community group, um, a Hukurangi based community group called Friends of Gomez. Uh, at the moment, we've spoken to you before, councillors, and at the moment our concern is to do with the Gomez Reserve. Um, we're trying very hard to protect it. Um, but in respect to the submission that we're talking about today, uh, we're looking at it from a, a point of view of allocation of funds. So, um, with regards to what constitutes essential spending and non-essential spending, um, everybody here today, I think, have already outlined um, pretty much how we all feel about what is, what is important and what isn't. But what I'm about to talk about is something that's probably not the kind of non-essential or essential spend that other people would agree with. So at the moment, um, we can see because the reserve, which is WBC owned, um, actually has quite significant um, natural state that hasn't as yet been recognised um, formally. And um, we're concerned because it's about 1.5 kilometres of fencing between the reserve and neighbouring farms, two neighbouring farms, um, which are either down, totally down, or in such disrepair that cattle are wandering in. So, um, under the, I've got a note here, Ministry of Primary Industries, as well as Forest and Bird, because forestry is also um, concerned, um, wandering cattle wandering stock into this area um, is, is very important and what we're concerned about is the threat of direct uh, kauri dieback. So with the cattle coming to and fro, as they please, uh, it is a very real issue. Now all over Northland we've seen what's happening with the kauri dieback. Um, we've seen over on the west coast um, how you know, parts of that is now closed. We can't go in there anymore and enjoy it because of the Cody Dive. So here, right in our backyard, we've got this beautiful area of land which which you control. Um, and at the moment, we're concerned. We're concerned because of the freedom of the cattle to go in and out, and they're actually trampling on regenerating Cody seedlings. So, is it an essential spend? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Um, do we, are we concerned about um, about our national treasures by way of our country? There's, there's not that many left in the whole of New Zealand, but we've got it right here in our backyard. Unrecognised, very few people have been there. I know that our councillors from Hogan, etc., have been there, and um, so they can attest to the fact that it does have some beauty that, that needs to be considered. So, Submission from Paul really is when you're thinking about what is essential and what is non essential, please also look at the bigger picture. Yes, all the roading is, is in a mess since Gabrielle, and we believe that is absolutely an essential spend. It's not just the roads themselves, but along the side of the roads, trees have been cleared, but they're still sitting on the side of the road. And in a lot of cases, um, I was just driving down the PY Road the other day, and it's still, even though it's been pushed to the side of the road, it's still a hazard because here's the side of the road and here's the, road, here's the trees. So, pathways, yes, but please, um, if you could just open, your, open a little bit further and look at the long term, the protection of our current forest, um, and look at maybe reallocating just a few thousand dollars, not much, towards repairing the fence um, in this one particular reserve that I can think of. I'm sure there are others. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate that. I appreciate that. Clear clarification questions from the councillors? No. Um, Family, do you have an idea of, of what sort of cost it would be for the fence? I know you, you talked in your submission there was 
a rough idea of cost, but have you got a, a better idea of what cost no, might be? No, we don't, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, you, do you feel if, if um, the Gomez Road community would be involved in, in helping out? So if, like, if council provided the equipment, the community would actually do it? Absolutely. Absolutely, we'd be interested in doing that. Um, because the, the land is actually owned by private people on the other side, um, they would probably have some say in that, but I'm sure they too would be happy to, you know, put their effort towards repairing that, but definitely um, friends of Gomez, the Gomez community, would be happy to do that as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you for coming in. Um, you, you also have the right to sit at the back again as with the others if you'd like to. It's not a problem. Now, uh, Brian Calder, you're up. Um, I saw you talking to backwards and forwards, but you're up in the, the front hot seat here. You've got five minutes. Um, now, Councillor, his submission, he's actually got his submission in two places, but the place I'm referring you to is uh, volume eight, page four. Uh, he's also on uh, volume 11 as well, but volume 8, uh, page 4. Brian, you've got five minutes. The bell goes after four minutes. We're trying to encourage everyone, rather than reading your submission, to actually talk to your submission and give the time for that and allow any possible questions come from the councillors. I'll try and do it quickly. Yeah, no <laughs> appreciate your time. We're going to start now. Yep, go for it. When I see the words ten -year, in your 10-year plan, like climate change, resilience, build back better, and reset, I know the budget was not created for the benefit of the local people, or by it. It's a plan based on a faulty agenda and bad data. You cannot accurately plan for a 10.9% rise when it's based on a hoax and bad data. For example, replacement of the Nangaroo seawall which you say is modified in response to rising sea levels. I have a, I have a letter here, and you can have a copy, from Bill Ho Hepner, the famous New Zealand fisherman, who wrote the Maori fishing calendar. And he's been measuring accurately the sea levels for 40 years. And he further researched back a further 100 years and finds there's zero sea level rises. Two, your climate change plan is based upon NIWA's document Niwa data has been totally debunked by Ian Wishart of the Daily Examiner. Look up climate fear. Climate of fear, Niwa's missing storm data and its impact on extreme climate claims. <coughs> Niwa have not counted 88% of the major storms in the past. So everything in your plan based on that is false. Three, carbon reduction is a complete madness. Carbon supports all life on Earth. I spoke to a climate expert who incidentally falsely claimed that she had gained a unanimous vote in favour of this radical 2030 climate agenda. She did not know how much carbon was in the atmosphere. She did not know how much carbon was too much. If you don't know how much CO2 is in the atmosphere and how much is too much, then how can you feverishly demand net zero carbon? Only a fool would demand this, especially with such little knowledge. For your information, there is just under 0.04% in the atmosphere currently, which is dangerously, it's a dangerously low point. If it goes much lower, all life on Earth could actually die off. Carbon has reached 40% during the last ice age. So clearly, carbon does not affect the weather that your budget is committed to. Four, videos of the Antarctic sea ice melting and breaking up look alarming. But if you realise those videos were taken in parts of the Antarctic, housing over 80 undersea volcanoes, you might see this drama in a different light. No amount of electric cars are going to change undersea volcanoes from melting sea ice. The climate hoax is a criminal and dangerous farce, and the people need to wake up fast er, and vote for anyone pushing this nonsense out of office immediately, before they cause large-scale human misery. Council has already confirmed that a large part of this budget is focused on the carbon reduction climate hoax. So why are you using language of the United Nations and World Economic Forum in your plans? Is the Fungary Council being run by the United Nations? Why is there no proper breakdown of expenditure? You have un an unexplained line item of 93 million, or 90.27, called other expenditure. 
I think you need to get hold of this budget. I think you need to hold and fire on this budget until it gets corrected. You get corrected, updated, truthful report from NIWA that has been independently verified that you can correct the budget and explain where the money is going. Then there will no longer be a need for, a, for to plan for this 2030 agenda, master plan, that threatens everyone's freedom using climate hoax excuse. No need for 17 sustainable development goals, ESG scores, smart cities and managed retreats. Have you told the residents what managed retreat is going to mean to them? Or are you going to wait until you are compulsory purchasing their homes by the coast and forcing them into surveillance, total surveillance smart cities to save the planet, of course? Once you have the correct facts and data, there will be zero budget rise, more likely a rebate. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. That is anyone else you want to add or no? No any, questions. Any questions? No, be you should guys should be challenging me like hell with the way you've been We can justify and justify what, what's Brian, right. just, just to clarify, we can only ask and clarify questions. So statement so when you make a statement and make, we can actually ask a question about that statement. There's plenty for to be clarified in what I've said and challenged. Yeah. No. Okay. Look, we, we appreciate you coming in. Um, Councillors, have you got any questions here? It's fine. Brian, you're more than welcome to is stand back there with the others and, and listen to all the other submissions. We do appreciate you coming in. I really do appreciate you coming in and making a submission about this. Thank it's you very much. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, councillors, um, at this point we're going to have a 10 minute break. Uh, this is basically uh, for anyone to get up and go to the toilet or anything like that. So it's going to be a 10 minute break. So we'll be back at, uh, looking at our clock there, will be 11, let's say 11.50, okay?
Elson Thompson, uh, she's speaking as an individual, and she's on volume 8, page 20. Elson, you've sat through quite a few, so you've got to hear how the process is. Yep. You have five minutes, it is your time. Uh, we encourage you not to read the submission, but to speak to it. Oh, well, I um, wrote a very short submission. You did? It was a very short one. <laughs> I, it's, and I'm nervous, so I'm going to read it. Yeah, read Take your time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the council, I stand before you today, I sit before you today, to address a matter of utmost importance, the proposed 11% increase in our property tax rate. This rate hike raises concerns among the citizens of Fonderay. And I believe it is essential to voice our collective objections. How did we get from the 4.5% rate increase set in the 21-22 long-term plan to this? I believe there was a one-off rate increase. There was a hearing about 6.5, council opted for 7. Uh, following COVID, rate reduction we had, but I, I couldn't really find it clearly laid out, and I don't understand how we got to where we are today, considering an 11 point, 11 percent increase. So first and foremost, we question the council's ability to manage money effectively. Over the years, there have been instances where funds seem to vanish into thin air, leaving the public puzzled and concerned. The council new building development project just seems to have a lot of money vanishing into thin air. It's a case in point. Your new council chambers are costing is an outstanding example. We implore you to provide transparency regarding the allocation and expenditure of public funds. It is our right as taxpayers to know where our hard-earned money is being directed and how it benefits our community. An expense line in the proposed budget listing 93 million, 93 million as other expenditure is unacceptable and creates a trust transparency crisis in this community. <laughs> Furthermore, it appears that our voices as the public are being ignored when we express the need for fiscal responsibility. We have urged the council to exercise restraint and stop unnecessary spending, but our pleas seem to fall on deaf ears. It is disheartening to witness our concerns dismissed, and we urge you to prioritize the public's input in decision-making processes. In addition, the struggling state of our local economy cannot be ignored. Many families and individuals within our community are facing financial hardships. The proposed property tax increase will only exasperate their burdens. It is essential to consider the impact of this rate hike on our fellow residents and explore alternative measures to alleviate their financial struggles. As I travel through our district, it becomes evident that our roads are in a state of disrepair and would not pass a warrant of fitness inspection. Potholes and uneven surfaces are a common sight, posing risk to both motorists and pedestrians. It is essential that the Council takes proactive steps to address these maintenance issues promptly. Neglected roads not only affect our daily commutes, but also impact the overall quality of our life in this district. Moreover, we have noticed a concerning trend where the council invests significant amounts of money into large-scale projects that do not align with the public's desires. It is vital to listen to the voices of the community and prioritize projects that truly benefit the majority. Our tax dollars should be allocated towards initiatives that improve the well-being and livability of our district, rather than projects that leave the public feeling unheard and unrepresented. In conclusion, the proposed 11% increase in our property tax rate rises or raises significant concerns regarding the Council's financial management, lack of transparency, and disregard for public input. We urge you to consider this rate hike and explore, the, or explore alternative solutions that prioritize the needs and financial well-being of our community. Let us remember your responsibility as public servants to serve and represent the best interests of the people of Bangare. I looked up the purpose of local government, trying to understand what you're meant to be doing for us. It's defined in the Local Government Act 2002, Section 10, as to enable democratic local decision-making and action by and on behalf of communities, and to meet the current and future needs of communities for good quality local infrastructure, 
local public services, and performance of regulatory functions in a way that is most cost effective for households and businesses. Together, if you stick to your jobs, we can work towards a brighter future that fosters trust, accountability, and prosperity for all, rather than this trust crisis, transparency crisis we find ourselves in right now. Please carefully consider all the submissions you're receiving, all the objections you're receiving today. Thank you. No, I appreciate that, Elsa. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you for making your comments that you have. That's great. I appreciate that. Councillors, is there any comments or any questions should I say for you? Elsa? No, there's not. But thank you very, very much. We do appreciate it. We have heard you. We are listening. Okay? We've also been taking lots of notes. Um, the next submitter is Scott Fletcher. Uh, Fre Fletcher, sorry, Fletcher, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm reading from this distance here and obviously I need to change my glasses. Um, Scott, your submission is on page uh, 11260. Uh, we've got you've got five minutes. We encourage you not to read it, but to actually speak to it. Well, I wrote it out to make use of your five minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll read it. Excellent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, I am here today to present my objection to the proposed rate rise. rise. I would also like to question the use of the word submission. When, questioning, when requesting input from the public, it gives the impression that we are being treated as passive subjects, expected to meekly comply with whatever decision is made. Perhaps we could find more inclusive terms. Now let's address the annual plan. It starts off by discussing weather events, as if they are somehow different than any other weather occurrences. Furthermore, the word inflation is mentioned on page one. But are our are, are wages increasing along with inflation? Unfortunately, the answer is no. It seems that while the council expects its, in its income to rise, it doesn't consider the struggles faced by the general public. The plan also talks about balancing income without mentioning how the council plans to increase its revenue. It seems to focus solely on spending other people's money. Another term that catches my attention is more resilient communities. I can't help wondering where I heard that before. Could it be from the World Economic Forum? It's concerning to see the council aligning with unelected billionaire bureaucrats without public input. I appreciate the line about the need to have financial resilience in challenging economic times. However, it feels like a sentence crafted by a think tank rather than a genuine understanding of the situation. That's why I prefer to use the term object. I sit here to present my objections to the excessive rate rises being proposed. Allow me to draw a parallel to a scammy marketing tactic, pricing a product at $99.99 instead of $100. It's a psychological trick used to deceive the unsuspecting public. Now let's consider our rate options, 7.9%, 10.9%. Why employ such tactics? Are you trying to deceive the public with decimal point numbers like some used car salesman? It makes us feel like mere tax cattle. Another questionable tactic is presenting two choices to the public. Similar to the sleazy used car salesman, here we are presented with the option of 8% or 11%. It's disheartening to see such unsophisticated tactics used against the very people who elected you and the funds your salary. Considering the significant amount of money wasted on endless studies, I propose a study to determine the cost of public engagement in protests, meetings, and struggles against these unfair taxes and bureaucracy. How much productivity is lost due to these engagements? Today is sunny, we should be out in our gardens. Let's imagine for a moment the proposed outrageous 11% rate in rise in land rates continues. Rates that will affect every person, landowner, business, lunch cost, or renter. In just over seven years, our rates will have doubled. By year 11, they will have tripled. In year 14, quadrupled. In year 15, quintupled. What will be done with all this money? It seems we are kept in the dark while you have free reign to spend as you please. I am unsure about the salaries of our bureaucrats. I have heard our regional council CEO is the highest paid government employee in the nation. Is this true? I can't seem to find it on the internet. Additionally, our local CEO receives a salary of 350000 a year plus benefits. Is that true? Why this gravy train? If we eliminate the top tier of government, would anyone even notice? Perhaps the unnecessary monstrosity being built next to the library could have been avoided, saving us $100 million. That makes me think about my neighborhood. 
All of us drive cars that are over 20 years old. If we were to adopt the plan EV policy, we would have to replace all those cars at least once, if not twice. However, my concern is not about the failed EV plans and money being taken from the old farmer driving his worn out use, youth to fund an unworkable EV plan. My concern is for my struggling neighbors. One of them has taken a side job as a night driver to make ends meet. Another cannot afford any extra activities for their children. Yet as another has taken family members in who can no longer afford the cost of living. I even see one of my neighbors trapping possums, not for fur, but to feed their working dogs. What is the council response to challenging faced by the people? More money from the taxpayers. If you want a mandate from the people, then show us what you can deliver for the current budget. So ladies and gentlemen of the council, I implore you to listen to the voice of the people. If you want a true mandate, show us what you can deliver within the current budget, rather than burdening us with excessive rates. Give us results, not just promises. In conclusion, let us reject the language and submission of demands and inclusive approach. It is time for the Council to remember that we are the active democratic participants, not passive subjects. We deserve transparency, accountability, decisions that truly reflect the needs of our community, and not some foreign power buying their way into the New Zealand landscape. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. Any questions for Scott? No questions for, for Scott? Is, is, look, well done for coming in. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've taken some notes. I know other councillors have as well. So thank you. Uh, councillors, we're going to break at this point here. Uh, our next lot of submitters are not be here till just after one. So we've got a 45 minute, uh, 45 minute break. Is it really Yep, so we will have a break at this present moment. Uh, and we'll adjourn. Do I have to move to adjourn? No? Okay, we're going to have a break at this point and for 45 minutes and we'll be back here again.
in to the public. It is great to see you all here. Um, all of you really great up here. And um, I believe we've got our first submitter. And um, just remind everyone again, the process that we're going through is everyone gets five minutes. Uh, there's a four minute bell that goes off. We encourage the questions. If there are questions, be answered within that five minutes. Because we've had so many submitters today, we try to make sure everyone gets their period on time. Uh, the first is it this afternoon. We've got Nancy uh, Morales. Is that, have I said that correctly? Morales. Morales. Thank you. And um, you're speaking on volume eight, page forty-nine for those counsellors. Nancy, look uh, again. It's your time. Uh, I, we encourage you because all, your, all the submissions have been read, so we, we encourage you to add anything else that you'd like to add to it. And I realise being the first submitter after afternoon, look, it's all yours. Oh, yeah. So go for Thank it. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm here today to oppose the annual plan proposal and the rate increases you're seeking. Fiscally and morally, you're creating a financial hardship for everyday people in the Fungare. The men and the women in the Fungare have entrusted you to lead, to make sound and economically sensible and transparent choices for their hard-earned dollars. This plan, with its lack of transparency and alignment with agendas from foreign entities, is a cause for deep concern. The rate rises you're seeking will negatively impact everyday people. In a time when food, petrol, power, water are at an all-time high, your proposed increase will mean higher rents in a time when rents are skyrocketing. What isn't skyrocketing are people's salaries. You are creating additional stress to already financially stressed families. What is most alarming is your blind alignment with agendas that did not have their inception in New Zealand. The agendas you're proposing to fund through rate increases have been created and cut and pasted from agendas of foreign entities, the United Nations, the World Economic Forums, individuals of extreme high net worth. These agendas are imported from abroad and envisioned not to serve the people of Fungare, but to serve the foreign entities that have poured billions of dollars to have government, governments embrace their rhetoric, their propaganda, and their world vision. The people of Fungare have entrusted you to lead. What path are you leading them down? Do you know? Do you know the roots of the path that you are blindly leading the people of Fungare? It's shocking not to be privy to the secret, undisclosed $93 million of other expenditure. $93 million of other expenditure. $93 million of other expenditure with no meaningful breakdown. No private business nor the IRD would accept this black hole of funding. This flagrant violation of standard accounting practices that you've slipped into this budget. $93 million of expenditure with no meaningful breakdown or accountability. This is a massive amount of unknown funds going to unknown recipients. Clearly and simply put, this is totally unacceptable and fiscally irresponsible to expect your constituents to agree to a massive rate increase with no transparency. The money you spent in the design of your annual plan with its trend, on-trend icons and on-trend language should have been spent creating a substantive document that would hold you accountable to the important privilege you've been given. May I suggest you take the time to educate yourselves 
on the sources and the agenda of your Build Back Better, Resilience Community, Resilient Cities, Managed Retreat, etc. While you all may be proponents of these radical proposals, the people of Fungaray, when they realize that you are envisioning these draconian and radical changes on how they live their lives and where they live. They will be shocked, disgusted, and their trust in you will be further shattered. In a time when the media is state-funded and journalistic objectivity is at an all-time low, I want to say to all the people that feel that you have already decided and that it's a lost cause, I want to say to those people that their voices do matter. I want to say to them, show up, speak up, and be the change. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. We just want to check to see if there's any questions here from the councillors. Councillors, is there any questions? No. I just wanted to make sure before we, before we left, but by all means, you're welcome to sit back there again and this is yeah, delicious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next submitter is Colin Hannon. Uh, Colin, come on up. Are you representing the Federation Farmers? Okay, uh, volume 7, page 13, uh, 23 in the other column. Okay. Colin, you've, you've heard it from me saying before, five minutes, it's over to you. We've read the submission. So just tell us some more information if you'd like, or you know, it's up to you. Thank you. What I would like to talk to you about, because you guys can all read, I'm not going to re read the submission at all. One of the important things going forward, what was the background of why we have, have come up with what we have in that submission, is I don't know whether, as number one industry in, in Northern agriculture, and land use change and the impact it's going to have on your region. For example, since 2017, we had 101 million milk solids produced here in Northland. This year, 63 million. That is a two billion hit on the Northland economy. And that's, that's going to be an annual hit. Then if we look at the forestry change, again, with the 25,000 hectares that are going into forestry at this point, over the whole of Northland, um, I'm still to do a bit of work as to what that annual hit is, but just looking at that process from 2017 to now, that's about 1.2 billion. So these changes are going to have an impact, and it's going to impact Wongaray, all the centres around, because when you lock the gate for foresting, there's no people coming into town. And, and just to explain how I got to that two million, we work on a nine times multiplier for dairy farmers. They've got deep pockets and they get paid every month, right? A beef farmer is a six times multiplier. He may have to wait a year for his income. So they're not going to spend as much. And yes, we have seen beef farmers pick up some of that drop in dairy because some of that land has gone into dairy, some it's gone into other uses. But it's nowhere near the in, uh, income for the region. It's nowhere near what it was with dairy. So we just wanted to put some background into why we've come out with our proposal, um, increasing the UAGC and for option two. Um, and that's what's backing it. Now, so for those who don't know, I also sit on the rural health, so uh, nationally. So yeah, I'm also have had that in the back of my mind and the impact on our rural communities. So I'm happy to take questions. Appreciate that, Colin. A good position, by the way. Lots of information in there. It was really good. Um, any questions for Colin? No, no questions. Okay, come on, I wasn't expecting that. Thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was a very good submission, so well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, Ellen Agnew, it's your turn up here. Um, yeah. Volume 1, page 431. I didn't have a chair. Will you use that chair? Yeah. Okay. I'm not a chair, I don't like <laughs> No worries. <laughs> uh, Nicolene's going to come in here. I oh, know, here we go. Thank you. And it's great to see you here again, Ellen. Yeah. You know, as I said before, you've got five minutes. Four minutes in the clean will spring a bell. Yeah, yeah I mean, part of the problem was I got four submissions. And the problem was when I didn't know until the, the last day that my wife said, oh, submissions um, finished today at four o'clock. Oh, woo! <laughs> so I had to panic 
and 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 they like said to the son at that time and the one watch for what the light card used to go to the okay and so I like to talk on four subjects and some some of them were pretty really, really short I hope <laughs> and uh, yeah one one thing the first thing I'll talk about is the for our poor for the for the disabled and the normal and we have not it's probably the only indoor indoor thing that hasn't had a premise in one way or right. It was all go in 2010 and then all of a sudden uh, 2011 rugby football came along and next thing they they promised to take us the normal down there and when the weather was trying to take it down there, they changed the plans because there was meant to be three shops underneath the building and we were meant to take the space of one of them. And the other story thing was if we weren't happy there, we could go back to Kensington. And that has not happened. And as you know, I've been trying to do that for the last uh, how many years? 11, 12 years. And I'll keep going. And the thing is, the rotometer has the best in your in your floor of the north. And we that's the point we go and play play a toe toe road and that's you know, has it got the balance of the floor is not that hot. And this year I understand that the national national indoor roles is coming to Wonka right. That's all I've been told, two thousand twenty four. It was meant to come a couple of years ago, um, but it was uh, cancelled because of COVID. And another thing I'll talk about is rates. And the rate had uh, used to get a discount for paying your rates. And I asked the question the last year when all your brothers were for council, I asked why was it cancelled? And they said, oh, it's only for the rich. Well, to me, that's an insult. And I look at it as when, when the rates come up, to, to, I'll pay my rates with a discount every year. And the thing is, you, you plan for that time, that, that's when you pay your rates. And then now, my wife's paying them every so many months. And I don't see those things. And then all of a sudden, oh, where's that? We're going to go into overdraft to pay for them. And that's where the, that's where I disagree with not having a discount and not encouraging people to pay your rates. And this and and, and for them going up and up. Um, you've you've got uh, what you call the what was trying to say, you've got three, you can do you know that sort of stuff. But what about us as farmers, we are, we've got to be thankful for what we get. And when the prices go down, we have a hard time. And when they go up, everything else goes up. We've got to chase them. Yeah. And I'll talk and that's the other thing. And you know, the other thing I'll talk about is the helicopter. It should stay where it is. The reason being is 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 that because of that area, there's hard there's you've got the You've got the Kensington ground, and you've got the school there, and you've got the, the far, um, short forest, and there's less houses in that area. And the thing is that when Manu Road was blocked a few years ago, the ambulance couldn't get there, could they? But if it, if it was a helicopter, they just go back to base and just go across to the helicopter and up to the hospital or out to Auckland. And a lot of people think. Too many people in the in the Kensington area think about me. We don't want it in our area. And it was amazing how I went to a meeting the other day and as soon as I walked in the door, they were thinking it should be out for a time at time. And I took a couple of judges out there to show them and, and they agreed with me. And I welcome any one of you to come out to, to my place and I'll show you the facts. And I can even show you where the airport could be. And I, and I told Mr. 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 Sidejack, and he said to put it in the submission. But 
Well, I wouldn't tell John to do that, but every time I have to walk twice, I'll show you. And because the one way you put in this, where you think you're putting this, is to it, the moment. And we have, and another thing is we have turkeys, paradise ducks, and there's the ducks on the, there's, that's only, that's only a portion of them. See the ducks up there? That's only a portion of them on my paddock. You imagine them flying in front of a plane. And you imagine the turkeys, turkeys and, and even the skylarks. People come out to my place and, and when they, when they, you know, get out the car door, they hear the skylark, oh gee, this is a nice place where you live. We hear the singing of the skylarks. Well, all that would go because we've been there for our, our, our well. And the other thing is, oh, you've got in front of you, and the it's paper, all the five days. And you see there's 16 in March. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and that, and the fog is only on that air, airport area, because it's like a river. It comes off the Mediterranean swamp. It all kept, can, and when you go on the radio, that uh, station, um, uh, 14, road 14, uh, it's got fog on it. Well, that all comes from the Mediterranean swamp. A lot of people don't realise, and I've spoken to people at Oyarafi, I've spoken to people that's been flat, and I've spoken to people out of the roof on them, and they, none of them have had fog, and it's only fog in that area. Ellen, it's, it's, it's been five minutes, Ellen. Yeah. Yeah, um, he, oh, he meant to be on 2.15. Yeah, I realise that, we've, 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 you know, it's, it's the, you, each person gets five minutes. Yeah. And we, tr we try to make sure everyone gets that time in there, okay? But somebody told me you, you've given somebody ten minutes. No, we, we've <laughs> only had, we've, they had two submissions, two complete separate submissions. One was for an individual and one was for, for, a, for an organisation. So each person's five minutes. Is there any questions for Ellen? No. No questions? Okay, thank you, Ellen. We do appreciate you coming in. Thank you. And, and it's, it's, it's good, always good to see you. Thank you. And you got smart and you were uniform. <laughs> Thank you, <Simon. laughs> um, James, uh, you're, in, you're coming up. You're in um, volume one, page 321. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you Thank you very much for coming along. You, you've heard for five minutes. You've got that. The bell goes at four, and yeah, we'll try to get you all done. Okay. Absolutely. Um, well, I'm here representing the Residents and Ratepayers Association of Porra Bay, a couple of hundred members. Um, probably the, the main, main point I'd like to highlight is that uh, in these challenging times where response to weather events and climate change, quite rightly, uh, call for councils um, with response and attention. Um, we, we would like, like to see um, that, that uh, council doesn't lose sight of ongoing commitment to, well, commitments that have already been made uh, to the community um, through, through the matters that are, that are raised in our submission. Um, this, this is why we acknowledge option one uh, that, that um, was part of the consultation. Um, and yeah, I'd just, just like to highlight that most of these matters have been decades in the planning. Um, for example, the placemaking process um, was preceded uh, by a village plan process back in 2012 that had led to um, detailed um, recreation reserve drawings being drawn up um, in 2017. Um, Closely connected to that was uh, the need for road safety improvements. Now we've got the speed review um, outcome. Uh, we uh, re really think that that's springboarded off and leads to uh, traffic calming and, and other measures that will help uh, bring about uh, greater road safety. Um, the almost complete sports field and um, just start starting skate park. Um, uh, uh, we really appreciate the, the commitments that uh, district council's made to uh, bringing these about, 
about, um, but we would like to highlight that neither have public toilets, and that will uh, considerably hamper the ongoing uh, the use of these facilities, particularly for females. Um, and there's the, the Wharf Road um, in investigation and commitment to ongoing community engagement, and we'd, look, we'd like to, to see that the Hawthorne and Geddes um, overlay option is considered. Um, there's, um, I'd like to see um, continued commitment to um, recycling and transfer station in Parra Bay, and um, last but certainly by no means least, least the Farrow Heads wastewater system. Uh, it's still spilling, um, and uh, there is commitment to uh, some upgrade. Um, that includes a, a storage tank at the top of Ritchie Road. Um, that tank has probably spilled four times in this, this year. So the Bureau of reports that say it spills once or twice a year, but I think it's three or four times last year as well. Um, and that spills into Park Tower uh, Estuary. And there are considerable components of the community out there that rely on um, Kaimawana and um, yeah, just just like to highlight that and that in the um, consultation document, you know, it talks about improving Farmer Harbour and commitments to that. It actually also extends to Baltimore as well. Um, and I think really that, that's it. Um, and, and that, 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 any improvements do take into account the increased frequency and intensity of storms predicted by climate change. I'm not entirely sure whether that's how, how long this the, um, the storage tank solution will be effective. Um, it doesn't at this stage have commitment to a UV treatment. And yeah, any, there's likely to be more and more, more intense development in Pirate Bay that's likely to put more pressure on the wastewater system. So I'd just like to highlight that. Oh, it's appreciate that. It's, no, it's really good, James. Um, good submission on the process. Any questions for James? No questions, not even from the local board councillors. Well, uh, he, he would take it out on me later if I asked him any questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, James. Thank appreciate you very much. Thank appreciate you. you coming in with the time, and look, feel free to sit there with the others and listen to the others if you'd like to. Okay, I have to dash, but thank you. No worries, appreciate thank it, James. James. Um, our next submitter is Cherry Herman, former councillor Cherry Herman. Yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone. I'm Rocky, our chair is going to speak to you today. Oh, okay. Right, Lockie, it's all yours. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to meet. Yes, we are the Forum North Trust of 2013. Um, as Cherry said, I'm Lockie McLean, I'm Chair of the Trust, and I'd like to introduce Cherry, who you all know, and we've got Alan Palmer, I think you've heard this morning, and uh, Sandra McCursey, oh, yeah. and Jeremy Clubbed, uh, all here to, to back me. We've come today to support the, the general rate rise of 10.9% to cover the rate rising costs in the wake of the high inflation and cyclone Gabriel. The community of the future will not thank past councils for their own rising costs associated, associated with poor maintained infrastructure or lack of civic amenities from the past. We hope you can find ways to assist those for whom rate rises are intolerable using the various levers at your disposal. We believe Council has made significant in inroads in past decades into sporting and recreational amenities while keeping general infrastructure programs in place. This is laudable, but the arts have languished. The Forum North site was bought to house the replacement of the old Wamaro Town Hall, which seated 800 people. 40 years later, we still have no replacement. We now find it is not only uneconomical to have touring concerts and shows in our 340 seat Capitaine Bougainville Theatre, but with larger seats and safety requirements, it is becoming impossible to house many local productions. Wamaray now has the lowest seating and poorest staging facilities of any provincial area in New Zealand by a long, long way. Yeah, yeah. 
The Fora North Trust has been coming regularly to Council for the past six years since our anticipated new theatre, listed in several past long-term plans, morphed into various conference, expo, etc. centres. The 2020 Momentum Plan clearly shows a new theatre was to be constructed alongside this new civic centre with dates 21-22. For the benefit of new councillors, this expectation was endorsed by the public with over 7,000 citizens taking part in online and face-to-face -face consultations, the greatest number of feedback ever received by the council at the time. The Trust has continued working behind the scenes with local groups here and around the country. Several of us visited Blenheim last year and were given a tour of their new theatre, similar in size to our needs here. We were very encouraged when we heard the very reasonable <coughs> cost of their build at that time. Sadly, years have gone by. With rising costs and inflation and a myriad of other factors, the ability of small trusts like ours to add significantly to funding for a new theatre have become diminished. There is still central government funding available, but the pathways to that seem to have changed and are perhaps more available to actual councils than trusts like ours. The cost of the actual build will keep rising. There never will be an easy time for a commitment to be made in terms of council coffers for the big ticket item. <coughs> the council is about to move into their new civic centre, so there is now space here for the theatre. It is believed with the existing four and more facilities and the new theatre all being in one area, Northland will have the most comprehensive performing arts centre in the whole country. This has created apparent interest from Tipu Kenga, who are interested in setting up a performing arts campus using all the new facilities. This would help revitalise the CBD, as well as benefiting the community in terms of wellbeing and education in the arts, due to the highly enhanced entertaining programme that will be available. It is easy to argue that there will never be a better time than now. This is why we support option one. We will be coming to see you again during the long-term plan submissions early next year to submit for our long-awaited theatre. We want our district to prosper and thrive and provide this facility for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. We appreciate that. Um, so we we'll see if there's any questions from the councillors. Any questions from the councillors? No? Lockie, look, a great presentation. I, I have to admit the one online was a very small version. Yes. Of what, what you've said, but yes. you have highlighted it well. Right, so if you want a copy of my blocks thing, I'm happy to send it to you. If you could, that would be great. Okay, thank I'll you. do that. Appreciate that. that. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, our next submitter is Margaret Coote. Uh, you are. There you are, Margaret. Excellent. Um, Margaret, your submission is on uh, volume 3, page 30 or 36 in the electronic version. Margaret, you've heard, you've heard the process before, you've got five minutes, four minutes, and the clean here's going to do a bell, but it's over to you. Thank you. Um, I've actually only been to two council meetings because someone challenged me to come along, and they were the most boring meetings you can imagine, and I know now why I would never be a councillor. And the, uh, I've, but then, and then I've had an opportunity to go to two public meetings, which I found to be an absolute whitewash. And, um, and I realise now why the community never comes to these meetings because they don't feel heard, they don't feel listened to, and so there's no point in coming. I canvassed my street that I live in and some clubs that I belong to and, and groups that I belong to, and they said, what's the point? What's the point of making submission? What's the point of coming? They don't listen to you, and I'm inclined to agree. Because it almost seems like you've made up your mind before the public actually has a chance to be consulted. And then the, the opportunity to, um, to share is not um, very transparent and, um, and doesn't often give enough time for people to actually make a submission or to go to the meetings because they only hear about them at last minute, they're not well advertised. Yes, absolutely. My submission was about how rates, I, I, I disagree with the rates rise at all, 
I said we're living in a period of time which is unprecedented with COVID. A lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of businesses have gone bust yes. and no one seems to care about them. There's a lot of people in our communities that have been vaccine damaged as well. And uh, so we've got a lot of, um, lot of people who, who would be adding to the workforce who are now no longer to be able to be in the workforce. And as well as that, um, wages have not gone up. And, um, and the, as it's already been mentioned, the food's rising, the cost of electricity rising, everything else is rising. But my pension is not rising. So if I'm on a fixed income as an old person, and I'm getting a 10% rise or more every year, where do you think I'm going to find the money for that? A lot of elderly people live on a very fixed and narrow income. They have a lot of expenses, medical expenses. They can't drive, so they can't take a taxi to town. They have to take, use a taxi if they can get a taxi. Um, a lot of people um, live on their own. They don't have anyone to help them with the COVID. A lot of um, carers are mandated. And so now they've got no one even to care for them or support them. And, and here, you're going to add to the extra burden. And, um, and not only for the elderly, this actually affects the um, poor. Now, a lot of young people in Whangarei, you will see the people living in their cars. You will see the homeless on the street. You will hear about the mental health issues and the psycho psychological issues that people are facing because they can't cope with our situation. And so all you're doing is making it worse. We'll have more crime on the streets, more people living in their car, more homeless. And this is what you are creating as a council. This is not beneficial for our community. You can use all the buzzwords you like, like sustainability, resilience, transparency, but it's total bullshit. You are not transparent. Where, did we get a budget? No, we didn't. Do we know what that 93 million going into the dark hole was spent on? No, we don't. When we asked at a meeting about the trannies and how much they got paid, oh, we're not answering that question, that's inappropriate. Well, no, it's not. You paid for those people to come and read in the library. So people have a right to know, but you don't want to tell them. So I suggest to you, you tighten your own belt, take yourself a decrease in pay, reduce your staff, reduce all your big fancy projects, and stick to the basics. When I have a budget, I have lots of wants too, but I go, well, this is all the money I've got, and this is what I spend on it, the necessary things. Food, housing, shelter, that's what I spend my money on. I don't go and buy new furniture. I don't put a big gold on my house or build a new shed. You guys seem to think you can spend our money regardless of how of the suffering and the conditions of the time we live in. You've got to get real. This is this is this is unprecedented. You guys have a responsibility to your community. And the community feel that you're not listening. Thank you. No, appreciate, you. <laughs> appreciate, appreciate you coming to the submission, Margaret. Was there any questions from the councillors? <laughs> no, it's okay. No, who would never? Yeah. Excuse me, because the public. Please be respectful of this place. We are trying to make sure that everyone gets a fair chance to be heard. And we want to make sure everyone does get a fair chance to be heard. So please give that chance to be there. Margaret, thank you for your time to come into the submission. We do appreciate you coming in. And we have, I've taken a lot of notes, I'm sure everyone else has too. Um, James Percy, you're up, please. Also known as Kate Percy. Uh, Kate, Kate Percy. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I, I just saw that there. It's okay. Speaking Can I make a disguise as my husband? <laughs> <laughs> So your, your submission's on page, uh, uh, volume one, page two. Very short two, and sweet two, and light-hearted. <laughs> but that's okay. Look, this is your time, five minutes to get so, to talk to about it. Kia ora koutou, um, thank you for your service and thank you for the opportunity to um, hear our, about our project. Uh, my name is Kate Kusi, as you've just found out. Um, I'm here today representing the Nungaru Skate Park Committee, the North Coast Board Riders Club, and the wider surf skate community on the Tūtukapa Coast. 
Um, today I'd like to bring your attention back to the Nunaru Skate Park project. Um, some pictures flicking through um, up there, our fundraising days, and uh, you can see we've got a pretty active community in terms of trying to see the project to completion. Um, we wish to be part of the annual plan 23-24 budget and seek funding to complete our project which will enable a significantly greater audience to make full use of the facilities. Uh, to date, there's been a, sorry that's a really good one, um, uh, there's a big group of people that are really passionate about this project on the coast and to date there's been a significant involvement from a number of parties in the community who along with WDC have contributed blood, sweat, tears, time and money and materials um, to initiate the first um, phase of the project. These groups include, but aren't limited to, Nungaru Sports and Recreation Complex, uh, the Coast Residents and Ratepayers Association, Nungaru Marae, Robinsons Asphalt, 30 MPA Concrete Limited, Toots Timber and Hardware, our local artist from Bespoke Designs, Vicky, Sanderson's Realty, I won't um, carry on with the rest of our list. Um, Phase one of the project is complete. Uh, this is the street skate area. Um, there should be a design photograph up there of um, the project so you can see it in its entirety. So this, um, the bottom right rectangle is in the red there is the street skate area. Uh, so that's phase one um, and that's really designed for intermediate to advanced skaters which at the moment caters to less than 5% of our skate and surf skate population on the coast. Um, phase two, which is the big long rectangle on the left, is the pump track, um, which will open up the park to a much wider audience of le uh, levels, users and various equipment, skateboards, scooters, roller skates. Um, pump tracks are hugely popular wherever they're installed around the country. They're great exercise and they can hold a number of people on various different pieces of equipment at the same time, so maximum plus entertainment for a broad spectrum of people. Um, and phase three, which is the top left red rectangle, is a wave style bowl which um, is designed to incorporate flow that uh, allows surfers who ride smooth star skateboards to have a land based option when the surf is not providing. So for the non-surfing skating community in our audience here, um, a smooth star skateboard is simply a skateboard designed specifically to simulate surfing but on land. Um, and a flow bowl design means that there's no um, there's roll-in sections rather than the coping, which is the metal bar that you see around the top of skate bowls, which often end in blood, sweat, tears, broken teeth and lots of bruises. Um, so roll-ins are much easier um, and obviously cater to a bigger audience. Um, so, uh, we're sitting, uh, we're still waiting on quotes um, from the next phase of our project, but the estimated cost is between one hundred and fifty dollars and $250,000 for completion. Um, on the coast, we've got an active and enthusiastic board riders club um, who run coaching clinics for skating and surfing of all ages. Uh, currently, the clinics are held at the Nungaru School, um, which isn't ideal because the school closes in the evenings and on weekends, so it's unavailable as a venue. Um, once the skate park is completed, it would mean the clinics can make maximum use of the facility. Uh, the following note is from one of the coaches who ran the clinics. So, North Coast Surf Skate ran two terms of surf skate classes at the end of 2022 and the beginning of 23. Uh, we ran classes at McKay Stadium in Kensington uh, we had, where we had approximately 40 individuals throughout a nine week term and we had to limit our class size due to the overall space and time constraints. In term one of 23 we ran outdoor classes at Nungaru Primary. We had over 20 enrolments of the classes which we then had to cap and we turned away at least another 20 applicants um, because we couldn't cater to them in that space. Um, at the beginning of the term we even had to pull down the advertising because of popularity of the class that we couldn't cope with. Um, and it, in both the town and the coastal classes we had a wide variety of attendees with our youngest being 5 and our oldest being 59. Um, with the skate park project with completed, we would be able to deliver more classes with more variety and also cater to a wider ability of surf skaters and, clip and, and have a clear progression pathway from learners right through to advanced. Our Board Riders Club has national title holders and a strong group of up-and-coming athletes who would greatly benefit from this facility. 
Um, in short, we're here to see the project through um, so it caters to the widest audience possible, um, therefore fulfilling the desires of the Nungaroo Sports Direct Club, which is to see the space highly used and enjoyed. Um, we extend maximum gratitude to WDC for any assistance that you can offer us in our community um, in a space where there's very limited entertainment facilities, especially for those 8 to 8. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Any questions from councillors? The only question I had, which was just clarifying your um, 150 to 250k, was that for the whole project or was it? I know that's for phase two of the project, which is the pump track. Which is the pump track, yeah. okay. And the whole total cost of the whole project was? Uh, we're looking at that same value again. So for all said and done, at the moment it's estimated at 500,000. And that's maximum? Yes. Those are, that's, uh, we're obviously, like I mentioned, we're still waiting on final quotes because when we have tweaks and design, the landscape architect was pretty reluctant to give me a definitive figure until he was finished with those, but that's, um, that's kind of the whole part of the and, and just to clarify, again, when you're dealing with the funds, um, I'm guessing a lot of the community will be involved in building it? Yes, yep, there was different parts of the, so the concrete itself was obviously done by a company, but then we've had, um, Decking put in and a shade sale and um, the artwork and those sort of things were all in community engagements. Okay. Thank you, Kat. Thank you very much for your Thank you. Good luck with the rest of your Thank you. Thank you. Um, just technically, those, those pictures will be added to the submission process for us to be doing right through. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next submitter is Christine Woods, uh, which is on. Volume 1, 389. Christine, would you like to stand, sit? It's up to you, you've got five minutes. It's going to be a long submission, brief, I hope. It's okay. Um, my submission, my submission is brief because I didn't know about the annual plan consultation and I didn't know about the annual plan meetings that were happening out in the community. If I had, I would have gone along and spent more time at here. But essentially, what I wrote is pretty similar to what I wrote through the long term plan process. Just but refund and using the standard form. So there's definitely an issue with communication and letting people know what's going on. Um, um, because I didn't, it was last minute there, it's also a little bit last minute here, and I'm not really prepared to be able to kind of fully, but you've got, I don't support the rate increase. You know, when I hear that out um, on the way out to the heads, there's been some recent work done in a car park with people curving and making it all look very nice, I realise that actually there can still be some cuts made. And um, I think that um, you need to ask staff to look a little bit harder at where cuts can be made. Because that wasn't essential. It's a timeline. Uh, where are we? Oh, you, you said it before. I support exactly what you're saying. All those things I support her. I support Helen. I didn't hear about it. You know, there's an issue there for you guys, and you need to kind of address it. So that we're not here next year, saying, oh, this is the same thing. So you know, there's something in terms of going on. You know, you've got to do a really good job. We need to be backed up by the staff. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to do it. We need to be backed up by the staff. So I don't know what's happening with it internally, whether you, what questions you need to be asking of your staff are, there's an issue because it's costing you. And um, I recently had a meeting last week, you know, we've got, I supported a group, the Northern Toxin Tox Awareness Group. 15 years they've been trying to have a voice with the council staff. Three years I think it was for me when I started and joined her campaign and it took, to, it took it to the chief executive and we got a meeting with those that needed to be here. Those that are to be held accountable and they hear that there, there are some real issues, legal, potential legal issues if it's not heard that particular one. I'm, for myself I've got an issue with, um, with the neighbouring, um, I'm surrounded by neighbours who have been found in High Court to be a dysfunctional group. Um, they have been known to the council since the early 2000s. There's illegal dwellings, illegal accesses. I'm the only one impacted because I'm there at the front and I get I get the dust, I get the noise, I get the I get the runoff. And I've been trying to work through council to get that resolved. And and where it's at now is that I'm then forced to court because council aren't using their legislative powers to uphold uphold the local government act, which it sits under, uphold the district plan, and that's where you guys are forcing me. I'm not the only one that's been forced into that situation. So I don't have anything more really to add, but gosh, you've got to sort out this listening problem and this communication problem. Thank you, Vince. So it's really lovely to see some of those faces that I met on the campaign trail. It really was, you know, it's 
I've got a better understanding of council and how they work through it. No, I really appreciate it. Christine, don't run away. Don't run away. Is, right. is there any questions for, for Christine? Uh, yeah, not a question. But just Christine, you, you and I did share a space together a couple of times, so good to see you again. Um, just the the improvements to the car park at Tower Tower, I think you're talking. Yeah, just just by way of clarification there, that, that was central government funding. Uh, so well, even they have to be, and they should think. Yeah, but, I, but I'm conscious that it just helps Thank to you, clarify. Okay. Because that drums up the Orderly Landing. I can't believe that I'm standing here again with the Orderly Landing development. What? You know, when I've heard that the, the, the arts are the Foreign North Trust have been trying to, you've got a facility, you've got something to work with. Well, why are we back there wasting our money dealing with that issue again? From my understanding, you were like six, seven or something, there's one vote in, in the support or whatever it is. That's not enough. You know, you've put it out there, you've heard from people, the support's not there. Go back to central government, use it down the Hawksley, use it on the relief. Come on, it's not the time to be. When we've got money, when we're a backwater district, yeah, let's talk about it. But not to be enough. Appreciate it. No, it's all good. Well, thank you. Some no, well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, words well heard. Um, our next person is Alexander. Fresh. Thank you. <laughs> like fresh. Red fresh. <laughs> fresh. Okay. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I had a very short notice to come today uh, because I actually didn't even have any notice to come. So uh, just a few days ago, I knew that this is going to happen. So I have an accent, so maybe we can have uh, questions afterwards for five minutes if you don't understand me. Anyway, I have to say I absolutely support the lady, uh, Margaret Quinty, yeah, and Nancy Morales. Uh, they actually say exactly what I wanted to say, and there's no point if I've got to repeat myself. They probably have better words to explain it than I do. Um, but my personal point is just to contribute to that is I'm actually absolutely upset about, or uh, uh, even angry about the council because I feel very neglected by the council. You know, there's so many apparently professional people who deal, uh, who's, who's supposed to deal for us. You know, because I think we are the rates payer. But we pay for your wages. You pay. We pay so you can represent us to be for us. And I can't see that. I can't see that in any issues we have. And coming up, I'm a, and I'm a rate payer. Yes. And I feel very really penalised for that to to be another person to pay 10.7% again. But I lost my job too because I can't work anymore. I was locked down. Uh, my business had to be closed down. So uh, I said, Oh my goodness me, how am I going to cough that up? I'm still paying my mortgage off. And I, I, I think I think that the government or you you need to contribute now to us a little bit, you know, to to to, to give us time so we can financially recover. Because if you don't have us anymore. You probably won't have a job with us. You won't have a job too. I think it's a teamwork we have to have. You know, we need a we need to have a we have to have a service system. We you know you have to provide something good for us so we can come with our energy to make a business out of that. If you make it for us hard, put every rocks and roots between that, it, it's going to be a fight. You know, and you, we're going to move away. I have so many friends who left the country now. They were investing in New Zealand. They bought a lot of land here. They were farming. They, I'm the only one left. I feel very, really, I feel very really lonely, and I said, "Oh my God, what am I going to do? I don't want to sell off. I put uh, six thousand trees on my property, native. You know, I put a protected land in. You know, so um, but I don't see any any help from the from the council, and this is my uh, my issue. What I have, you know, and I, I'm just not willing to pay the ten point eight percent. I'm not willing because for what? Sorry, for what? Explain it to me, you know? I don't want to, I've never been asked for this monster building of steel and concrete uh, of uh, the council building. I've never been asked for that. This, this is our money, this is our money. I, I, I honestly, I would have no problem if we would have that building as a hospital. Yeah. I can show you probably 20 pictures that I took just in the last three months because I look after my old friend, he's 90 years old and he's been in so many different wars. I take in all the pictures of the photos, uh, sorry, of photos of the windows in the, council, uh, in, in the hospital. They're sealed with sticky tapes, with plaster, the, you know, so the kerosene smell can't come in. It's filthy, and I thought, oh my goodness me, this should have been built first. We should have had a hospital, an intact hospital. You know, that's where the money is. If that kind of, if this has happened, if that 
millions or 93 million would have been put in there, I would be say, okay, have it. Because I, I prefer to put the 10% in there, you know, because I give 10, uh, I give a thousand bucks a year to, to, to John Eaters or whatever, call them the, the animal land service, I do that. Yes. For the hospital, I do that, but not for a council building. We got one. It's pretty. It's cute. You know, you got a job. Yeah, this is all fine. We didn't need that. Not at the moment. Yes. This is, oh, that's my thing. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's not because I don't like you. I don't even know you. Sorry, but I mean, it's it's. Um, you have to think about us. We employ you. Don't forget that step. We have employed you to represent us. Because we believe you have a good voice that you can explain us what we want. You are our words. I come with my little bitch in English, yes. But I hope that one of you understand, oh look we have a few people that are not happy with us. We need to look after our community. I think that would be a nice reflection. And if we have a proud community, a good council, there's nothing wrong with it. Then we have people coming in. Because you feel, oh that's nice here, that's good, look. That is good. It's good to make business here. It's good to have an infrastructure. It's good here. I know it's a lot of money, but you know, I think we're wasting a little bit of money. Sorry, that's what I have to say. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you for standing here. Appreciate you doing the submission. Is there any questions for the council? Sorry, point out. Just point of clarity. We we don't fund hospitals. That's a government's job, not us. I know. I know. Still taxes. No, I think it's important that we actually correct some of the, yes. the statements here. But yes, we we will certainly love a new hospital too. Absolutely. Because you've got to be in there one do one two, you know. Yep. You don't want to be flying right down to Auckland and queue up for eight hours. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well done. Thank yes. you very much. Thank, thank you for you. taking the time. Really do appreciate. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, okay, so we have now got uh, Angela Stoller. Yes. From now we've got volume one, page 357, from the Whitehead Cycle and Walkway Trust. Angela, all yours. Right, Jennifer, I'm Angela Stowe with Taku and One, and I'm here regarding the Waipa Village to Waipa Cove Cycle and Walkway Project. For those of you here that may not know that this is a 9k trail, it was community initiated, WDC supported. And once each stage is built to the council requirements, the council takes it over as a council asset. Uh, the stretch road has little or no verge, deep culverts, and is busy, even without the state highway one diversions um, for accidents and road repairs. So I'd like to thank, actually, the WCDC staff and councillors for the support and commitment to complete the trail um, and acknowledge the inclusion of it in this year's annual plan um, draft and consultation document. But I thought you hard update you with some progress. Um, two thirds of it has been completed. The first third from Waipu to Riverview Place is about two and a half kilometres and is council asset now. The second third actually started at the Waipu Cove end and came back to McLean Road and that um, has now a council asset too. Both of these sections were enabled courtesy of two landowners uh, giving really generous easements. The current middle section is taking a while to progress because we have taken a while to obtain a nine, nine further landowner easements. So I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge these landowners, their generosity and their altruistic spirit for ensuring a safe community asset. Because, yeah, it's um, we're still concerned with securing funds and adding to our bank balance to complete the fencing and construction. Uh, we're permitting, we have contractors due to start a part of it in July. We encourage WDC to initiate the bit, their bit so we can all be finished at the same time. I wanted to say that the word connectivity pops up a lot when planning documents and it is marvellous to see that in practice. The walkway is used by the Te Aroa walkers, it's used by um, mums and baby groups, it's used by you know, people walking into town, you know, so it's used a lot. But I would like to share one story for you that I gleaned from my work yesterday. And 
And I often see one of my colleagues striding out on, a, on her own, on the Waipu end, this is. She's not down the beach, she's at the Waipu end. And I often drive past and see her on it. And anyway, when I was at work yesterday, she happened to be working um, a shift at the same time as me. So I said to her that I was coming here today and that I often see her on the walkway. And would she have me say anything? And I'm not making this up, she said, she wanted me to tell you that she lives on a windy, rural, unsealed, wipe road, frequented by logging trucks and school buses. And I thought, oh gosh, don't ask me to ask them to task you road. <laughs> so anyway, that's not where she was going. She was talking about the fact that um, her words were, the walkway is invaluable. It's the only place in Waipu where I feel safe walking and I need it for my physical and mental health. And she assures me that along the way she meets other people who live outside of the township who drive there to walk somewhere that is safe. And um, yeah, so I thought that that was not necessarily a connectivity story, but, um, but an important thing about feeling safe where you do, do exercise and get space. So, in conclusion, on behalf of the walkway group and users of the trail, vehicle users who are also enjoying the road with less bike and pedestrian traffic, um, thanks for your ongoing support. And I know you're between a rock and a hard place, but we have just said that we um, know that we can continue improving amenities like this. We, you know, have to support the road increase. Please yeah, yeah, appreciate your submission, Eva, and I appreciate the story. Well done. It's a it's a good story to highlight the what's happening in Waikato. Thank you. Any questions? Oh yes, Councillor Peters. Uh, just a comment, Your Worship, uh, that it is amazing questions, wonderful to see questions. what collaboration can result in, and yeah, it's yeah. just a privilege to do partnership with your group to improve the amenities in your area. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll allow that for this time, Councillor Pitch, we've got questions. <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Angela, I appreciate you coming in. Thank um, you. And well done on the submission. Thank you. We, should, we, should, we do need to encourage collaboration. <laughs> um, Councillors, we now got uh, David Barnes. Your submission is on volume one, page 423. And um, again, look, we're going to encourage you. You don't have to read it, just talk to it. And um, we've got five minutes, four minutes to clean. We'll do a bell for you, okay? Kia ora, good afternoon, councillors. I am known as David Baines. It could have been handy to have had a microphone here because I've had great difficulty hearing the preceding speakers. Thank you for the work that you do in our community, particularly with the town walking loop. I've seen that used by mothers with crayons, seniors, Zimmer frames, all sorts. That is brilliant. And also the other walkways that you keep open. And also the amenities for the youth because they are our future. And if we can keep them reasonably straight till they become sensible, it's a very good investment of our resources. We know that there is inflation, which means that the cost of many things have gone up for families. So what do banks do? put up interest rates to crush families even more to lose their homes. To me it sounds counterproductive, but then the higher authorities always know best, so they tell us. I find it destructive and stressful. No wonder anger, anger and violence and family breakdown are increasing. We're told to save for our entitlement. What a waste as it devalues. So $100 is worth $90, and the next year it's 80 then and so it goes down. I'm aware of medical people who have been put out of their work because of this government carry-on with the COVID agenda. Nurses have had to take their early retirement because they were not willing to cooperate with this government agenda changing. How is it that petrol in what way I understand is 40 cents higher than Hamilton? Yes. I don't know where this money is going to, but if it came to the council, it could be quite handy for them. Mm. And there seems to be coordination with the petrol stations. They sort of go up and down together. 
I suppose it saves, saves time driving round and looking at every petrol station. It would be handled to you if there was a website that told us which was the most economical station. I went round the Hunderbass the other day. I don't know what he was on, but it must have been strong. For the number of people who were there, I hope it covered the employees' wages. I doubted its viability before it was started. Then we had all the overruns in costs, and now it's become, I understand, a liability which you have now placing on us ratepayers. It had overrun costs when built, which we have to now cover with the interest, I would imagine, increasing. The old council building up Bank Street that burnt, I have difficulty understanding why the council needs to spend seven plus million when it was three million, but it'll probably go up to 10 million that, um, that will only increase. Or restoring an old building that is probably not needed for council activities. When you must have spent several million on that dark nuclear power station that is now where the seniors bowling club used to be. I suggest the old Burke building is disposed of in the most economical way possible. Often building new is more economical and functional than renovate, renovating old and dysfunctional. Our home is insured for replacement to the same state. I'm surprised the council didn't do the same. Is that building necessary for the council's function? No. Dispose of it. I'm disappointed and being disgusted that our water rates have gone up by a third. I understand the council took on loans to build dams to the refinery water security. Powers above arranged for our refinery to be shut down and now are lumbered with this loan with interest to clear. There should have been a clause that said that if the refinery was shut down, the refinery authorities would clear the infrastructure debt. To me, that would have been basic. Now the refinery is shut, you have a debt dumped on us. We're at the mercy of the market and the powers for our fuel. I suggest the government should pay, but then the government is you and me and we still end up paying for something that we shouldn't be. You need to get out of the extra fancy stuff and into maintaining infrastructure and basics at this time. Realign your budget and tighten your belts. It is my money you are spending and it is not limitless as you seem to think and act. You treat the ratepayers as though they are a bottomless well of money. We are not. Many could default on paying their rates because of money that they don't have. Many have been put out of their employment. Two of my daughters were, and they were very good citizens and serving in the medical profession. Many you have put, put out of employment by the vindictive government. Do we cut off power to our homes and stop eating medical, or could we stop paying taxes? You are being totally unreasonable. We must not keep doing this. If rates this year were 2,200, and every year you put the rates up by 10% to 2,029, they will be 4,287, nearly doubled in seven years. You cannot, must not keep doing this unless your plan is to destroy society with the Fourth Reich under Klaus Schwab, which is in the process of happening. Get real, stop empire building, saying, look at the structures we have built. It is better to say, look at the society that we have supported and protected. Stop wasting my money and our money on none infrastructure at this difficult time. American banks have been going bust. When will Australian banks that own us collapse? Many businesses already have. The world is not normal anymore. Central Wangarei has so many empty shops now that won't be able, won't have the income to pay you rates. David, yes, um, you've actually gone over your time. 
over your five minutes. The bell went off a couple of times. Sorry, David. I'm just trying to. A bell went? Yes, a bell went. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't leave you with the bell. I, I'm sorry about that. I was, I, was, I, was, I was trying to get your attention, but you were reading so well and focused on your reading. <laughs> uh, is there any questions for David? I'm over it. Yes. That's disappointing. Okay, if that's the. But uh, with, your, with your information, since you've got it there, do you mind handing it to the staff so they can copy it and give it to the councillors to read? Right. Okay. Do, you, do you mind that? Okay. I see the lady outside. Yep, 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 yep absolutely. But okay. thank you, David. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, next one's Stu. Now, I believe, Stu, you've got Crane Carter doing it? Yeah. Or are you doing it as a team of effort? Uh, Craig's going to come and speak here. Yeah, speak. Okay. Uh, Craig's got Stu's submissions on volume 7, page 90 or 93 for the councillors, or in electronic form. Uh, as, as, as previously stated, Stu and Craig, look, your submissions have been read, it's been gone through, so what we'd like to do is, is to highlight anything that you'd like out of it, or like to speak to something else on that. That's fine. Cool. You've got five minutes, so the time is yours. Four minutes, the bell will go. Cool. Thanks for having us. Um, for Stu Kakoma, uh, for Sport Northland, for Places and Places uh, Mahiana. So I work for Sport Northland. Um, the submission we have in today is in relation to a potential increase for the casual admission to the aquatic centre um, or uh, an increase in operations to uh, cover a similar um, value. So, a uh, little bit of context, we have, uh, Sea Island's approached us probably for the last four or five years, indicating that there's a need to increase the, uh, the general admission. We have uh, declined that request for the past few years, but we feel to the point now where something has to change. I've um, asked Craig Carter, the CEO of um, Sea Island, to come up to speak to the submission today, so you will have read it. Um, it's all pretty basic. And I think Craig's got a few points to, to make from that. So, kia ora, thank you for having us. Thank you, Stu. Thanks, Stu. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. I'll keep it pretty short and sharp. It's been over 10 years uh, since we've looked at the operational subsidy and admissions. And the reasons for that is that we've really prided ourselves on being good partners and working with Sport Northland. And prior to COVID, inflation was only travelling at sort of two, two to three percent. So we we tried to wherever, wherever possible to absorb those costs. Obviously, over the last two and a half years with the COVID interruptions, probably wasn't a good time to look at admission prices with all the different interruptions. So we didn't want to go there. But now we've got got ourselves at a stage where inflation has gone through the roof since COVID, as everyone knows, and the CPI rate has increased actually by 28% from where it was over 10 years ago. Hence why the two options have been presented. Uh, other councils are looking at it uh, throughout the Wotu and going through exactly the same process as, as we are here today. So that were probably the two key points I wanted to highlight. What? Council staff questions? Yes. Okay. Council have any questions? Council helps. Just one to just for clarity, so you are asking us to increase our subsidy to for admittance. There's two options here. Yeah. It's either increase the operating subsidy or increase the emissions. So what the user pays more or we cover that um, higher increased grant. Your Worship, we used to have a annual meeting between Sport North and the Council. You worked that out and it's been worked with success for you. I find it quite alarming, it's not working. So uh, is there is no meeting anymore? Oh, you meeting, so aren't there? Yeah, so there is, there's, you're correct, there's advisory meetings, and that's where these would get um, passed. So you're right, um, Vince and so forth, yourself have been involved in those. Um, and at the last, we did have one at the end of last year, I wasn't in attendance. I don't think we had um, the correct people to, to pass a vote. However, the discussion was held, um, and there was a recommendation to move this proposal forward, hence the reason we've come here rather than making a decision ourselves. But you're right, looking at the terms of residence, there should be two small Northern councillors and there should be two. Um, we've only had just for council councillors and those are the those are to cast the votes. Unfortunately, there were four uh, voters in the, in the room, so we'll make sure that that's in place in the future as well. Thanks, you. Uh, Councillor Peters, you've got a question there. Yes. Um, will this increase cover the um, uh, renovations and improvements that are needed possibly in your centre? 
This will solely uh, ensure that the day-to-day -day running of the facility is at a level that is expected and required um, to meet the um, centre function. Have you, um, have you, excuse through the chair, have you um, put together any um, budget of how much the improvements might need? We have a long-term maintenance plan, yeah. so there is some clarity around what's needed to be spent to ensure that water quality and air um, um, quality etc. is, but the actual upgrades, no, that has not been. We are currently in the process of developing a um, quality facilities plan, yeah. which WC is part funders of. That's due for completion. Um, in June, which will be available for uh, consideration in LTP planning, which will give a good indication of what's required in relation to the facility. Thank you, Mr. So, so just, just for clarification, what Councillor Holster just said before, you're, you're going to organise that meeting, we need to organise two councillors to go on that. We will, those come up after, so we will be holding one at the end of our financial year, so in about July, we would like this to be considered now. Yeah. For future, yes, there will be ongoing advisory committee meetings that you require two councillors to the for. Thank you, thank you, that's appreciated. Oh, Councillor Olson. Um, through, through the chair. Um, so when you've formulated um, the work needed in, in the plans, will that come back to council for, or will it just go through the um, board and, and the committee members? Or will it come back as a, a workshop or a briefing? The plan, the facilities plan, yes. the project facilities plan yes. will come back to council. Sue Hodge is um, leading that paper, so it will end up back to the for consideration into planning for the, um, the next LTP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look, appreciate that you guys coming in and do the submissions. Appreciate it. We're, we're going to go through this process, and it's good to have you in here, and we really do appreciate you coming in. Okay? No problem. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. Yep. Uh, next minute is Janet. Uh, your submission is on volume 1, 400, page 419. <laughs> Come forward, Janet, and um, this is this is in a scary place. It's okay. We would like you just to. We've read your submission. We've gone through that moment, so we'd like you to speak to it if you can. We've got five minutes, and again at four minutes, Nicola will ring a bell. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, not very practice at this, so <laughs> forgive me. But um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and hopefully be listened to and not merely heard. I would firstly like to point out that while I stand here physically alone opposing the proposed 10.9% rates increase for the, coming, for the coming year, I know that I represent many people who are unable to make themselves available in general because they are hard at work, earning the money to keep themselves and their families afloat, or are supporting these workers by caring for their children, perhaps even home, home educating them, and or supporting members of the wider family who are suffering physically, mentally, and more emotionally, from as a result of the events of the past three years. As someone who trusted implicitly that the individuals we elected to central and local government were there to look after our, the people's, interests and well-being, I have unfortunately come to realise that, generally speaking, nothing could be further from the truth. I have watched and continue to watch as our rights, dignity and personal autonomy are systematically stripped from each and every one of us as the sense of power and the almighty dollar replaces caring and empathy for our fellow human. And so I stand before you appealing, although that sounds too much like begging, addressing the human, not the corporate, and I do hate that word, qualities I pray that still exist in the WDC. Skill or strategy I've been made aware of in the last couple of years is to ask questions of the person or the persons with whom I'm engaging. So rather than stand here and expound my theories and reasons as to why our rate should not increase by the proposed 10.9%, I pose the following questions to WDC based on the annual plan consultation document. 
As you acknowledge, households are facing the same increased inflation rate. Belts, belts therefore, require tightening, and needs take priority over wants. Now is not the time to be considering adding to assets and attractions. Maintenance of existing facilities and services has to be the priority. Why, pray tell, was the monstrosity of new offices even contemplated, let alone constructed, in the current climate? And I know for a fact that extensive remediation work is being carried out before the building is even occupied. Why? The word growth is mentioned in the consultation document. How, when people's businesses, livelihoods and even lives are being destroyed around us, can you even consider talking about growth, especially of the economic kind? Whangarei has many attractive, aesthetically pleasing features, but we also have an increasingly horrendous crime rate, which I don't see as being addressed. This is not central government's problem, it is ours. What does WDC propose to do about this? And talking of central government, when is WDC exiting LGNZ? An infiltrating government-controlled powerhouse looking only to dictate what happens to local, in local communities, to bring them into lockstep with government agendas and charging us for the privilege. No thanks. Fluoridation of our water supply, again as dictated by central government, is my next issue. When will we hear that WDC has said no and is standing up to protect its community? Or will it just quietly happen? Maybe it has already, and no one will be any the wiser until we all start falling sick from the ingested poison. As for three waters, what a debacle. All, des all designed for legislation to be passed at the exact time of local body elections under the confusion of changeover. When will WDC stand up to the manipulation of central government? Has anyone ever looked at the possibility of operating <laughs> without Big Brother's blood money? All of the issues I have raised carry a price tag we can well do without. Again, thank you for your time. And I would like to end on a positive note of extolling the virtues of grassroots council staff. The service I've received has always been exemplary. Thank you very much indeed. Janet, before you disappear, oh, is, is there any questions from the councillors? Is there any check? No, but Janet, thank you very much for your submission. It was well heard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you've got stuff there that you would like the councillors to have, um, all means hand it to the team there, they'll, they'll copy it for us, OK? Lovely. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Our next person is Alison Jeffs. Um, very Alison, there we go. Uh, volume 1, page 444. Alison, you've heard the spiel before, five minutes and four minutes. Yep. The will come out. <laughs> it's okay, it's not a problem. Um, I noticed your submission was fairly short, so I hope that you've got more to expand to that. Uh, just a little bit. Excellent. Um, thank you, firstly, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Alison, and I live on the Kitakaka Coast. I've uh, been a ratepayer of Whangarei for over 30 years. Um, I was an individual with many different business. Um, and due to the extents of COVID lockdown in New Zealand, I feel that we now have a very fragile economy and a prolonged cost of living crisis. All long-term planning has been skewed and is no longer relevant to what we are facing now. Interest rates are rising, mortgage rates have increased, putting pressure on everyone, every aspect of their life. Everyone has to tighten their belts in order to survive. Most people are concerned with putting food on the tables, educating their children, accessing health care, and surviving economic despair. I do not agree with the proposed rate increases. I'd like to see that the Council shall all projects and continue to provide only essential services during this economic crisis. And projects that don't have the support of the rate base. You know what they are. 
move to minimise the losses of projects that were meant to be self-funding and are now requiring loans from ratepayers or council money. Community funding grants are currently being advertised on community Facebook pages. I would like to see these halted for the near future. Do a full analysis of employment within the council. I hear, I don't know if it's true, but there is, there is a person employed to count cats. And they're on 80k a year. You have the power to make important decisions on our behalf. And if you choose to press ahead with grandiose projects, you will be ignoring the opinions of most of the people that elected you to represent them. It would show a lack of respect and that you are out of touch with your people. Please let your service as a councillor be remembered for the right reasons. Support your community through these difficult times and don't add to their woes. To summarise, I want you to budget to fix the roads, do something about all those claims we have to have. Provide the essential services, shelf all projects, pay off council debt, and consider removing Whangarei District Council from the LGNZ to save money and minimise coercion on issues such as three waters. Thank you for your consideration and service to Whangarei District. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Just wait two seconds to see if there's any questions. Okay. Um, look, I appreciate your submission. Any questions from the councillors? No. Oh, Councillor, just want a clarification. Did you say you wanted to halt or you will stop all community funding? I would like to see it halted for now, yes. Okay, cool. Interesting. Thank you. I just think that could be a cost saving. Yeah. No, I appreciate the submission. Alison, thank you for taking the time coming in. I know it's very nerve wracking, it so it's okay. You did very, very well. <laughs> thank you very much. Our next submitter is Patrick Tatley. Uh, Patrick, where's Patrick? There's Patrick, excellent. Do you want to come forward? Absolutely, please. So your, your submission is on volume 1, page 420. And we, we encourage... I've got a short statement, I want to say. Um, I'm, I may be seven, my hearing's not so good, and although I've got a written statement here, it's, um, it's a challenge. I've, I've never ever had to present myself ever before in my life. But I'm here today and um, yeah, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Am I allowed to sit here? Absolutely, Patrick. It's, it's for you to sit here. Um, look, by all means, before you start, just, you know, if you're hard of hearing, that's okay. Just if, if you'd like us to speak up, we can speak up. Um, we, we have a ballot four minutes. I would prefer that you, you could speak up. Somebody told me I've got five minutes, is that right? That's correct. Yes. yes. Thank you for that. Yeah, so I've got hearing aids, <laughs> but um, they're probably nearly as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm we'll giving a fling, eh? Right? Yes. Okay, all the rules, Petra. Good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. My name is Paddy Tatley. Well, maybe so. My, my profession is plumbing, drain bag and gas filling. I uh, had a small little backyard business in Auckland for, for about 12 years before my health packed up. We shifted out of Auckland 50 years ago and bought 16 acres, 16 and a half acres in McLeod Bay. And we thought we'd found Utopia. Oh dear me. <laughs> Yeah. Been there 50 years now. And six months after we bought this property, the wife and I were so proud of it. There's a historic house in the middle of the paddock. It's called the Stewart House. It's a historic house. We lived there for a long time. Uh, today, well, this is, this is my plum stick here. Look. Well done. Self certified. I had five men working for me in Auckland for about 14 years, right? Plumbing drainage, gas filling. Now, now, today I want to talk about council. Um,
Some of you people might not feel quite so guilty, but 50 years is a fair long time. And we've been kicked around a bit by councils, not you guys, but your people that were here before you. So let's make that clear. I want to talk about, because I'm actually a, a small backyard businessman and I've given it a flame, okay? I want to talk about attitudes, incompetence, neglect, abuse, waste, waste of funds. I'm talking about the rate payers money. And when we went to school, what did they tell us? A stitch in time, say nine. It's as old as the hills. Just a bit older than me. <laughs> now, the pollution is shocking. When we shipped it into our bay 50 years ago, I made soup out of the seaweed. And it was beautiful. Not now. I've spent many hours inside septic tanks, fixing up broken square junctions, you name it. And the muck's flown over the top of me gun boots. But the muck's in the harbour now, and it's disgusting. I'm still collecting seaweed for the compost, but oh dear me, when you pick it up, it's shocking. And somebody should be downright ashamed of the mess we've got. Now, six months after we bought the property, it was rural. Six months later, it's residential. And my health wasn't good. That's why I should be out walking by head. I thought it was dying. So we put up with it for 49 years. And it seemed like all we were doing was working to pay rates because our rural man is now residential with a wife and mortgages like most of us have got and three kids at school. Not easy, but we, we slaved on. Okay, so not long after it was made residential, uphill, is made uphill, is residential. There's a whole lot of houses going up. There's shops, a block of shops. And what happens when it rains? We had two beautiful little streams in our paddocks. They, they had eels in them, they were gorgeous. But oh dear me, what happened down there, right? Our beautiful blue bay. A couple of hours later, it's all brown. It's full of mud. And it's our paddocks. So our boundary was all the way up T Rooms Hill, that's Wamaray Hitch Road, all the way up to the shops. And our back boundary was Rear Tahi Road. And up here we've got Mount Aubrey, and up there we've got Mount Benai. And the residential land up there is discharging water down into our place that was so beautiful. But guess what's happening now? The brown colour in the harbour is the mud coming out of our paddock. Okay? So, for about two years now, the junction where Wallerhead Head Road meets Rear Tahi Road it's all falling to bits. The footpath that I paid for 45 years ago with borrowed money, there's 40 metres of it. And it's metres below the road. And it's been like that for two years or more. What are you going to do about it? It's shocking. You couldn't scribe about it. Okay, so I went up a couple of months ago and I had a chat to the guys that were working there. And I asked for the site foreman. 
And I had a good chat with him, and he said, we're trying to fix it, but I'm sorry, it's only temporary. And that's, that was the end of the discussion. Okay, so where did we get to? Hey. Uh, after, after about six months, hey. they took two meters off our... Hey. Paddy, sorry to say this, but your, your five minutes is up. Um, can, you, can you summarize something? Can you summarize something, Paddy? Can I summarise something? Yeah. I'm disappointed you won't give me another two minutes because it's nearly, it's nearly finished. If, if, if you I'm grossly, grossly disappointed. Give us two minutes. Give us two. Yeah. Have my the council took two metres of the main road boundary of our land. They never paid me. They took two metres of our mortgage land so as they could strengthen the road shoulder. You all know what the road shoulder is, don't you? The road shoulder holds the road up. And inside the road is a sewer pipe. It's the water main. It's the fire main. It's a compressed air pipe that goes to Rear Tahi, two miles away down there, to blow the sewerage up, up the hill and down to the Wangarei McLeod Bay sewerage station for further pumping. And the water main snaps. If it's happened once, it's dozens of times. Guess what? I don't own the land now. My daughter does. And you go up the creek, and guess what? It's like bathing in a septic tank. Because the sewer pipes are snapping off inside the road. What are you going to do about it? Hey, thanks for your time today. I think you've all, all had enough of me. Wheelhouse to fix. 
um, how we believe are relevant to our submission and to our position as small businesses in Friday. Um, we have a little quote from the mayor himself um, saying that it feels like every time we edge towards recovery, um, we're hit by another economic bombshell. And that really accurately describes how we're feeling about the current car park closure in the town a um, little bit of a timeline, I actually only moved my business to the Town Basin in July 2020. Um, so I only had the details of notification of the car park closure from that time. Um, however, we were recently notified the week before Easter, the week before Easter weekend that the car park was going to be closing during the school holidays over that training period. Um, we did request that this was delayed a further two weeks um, to allow for uninterrupted trading through the school holiday period, which is traditionally quite a busy trading period for all of us. Um, this was denied. Um, we had some fairly shocking data from the four businesses which I represent today um, about the drop in. Visitor numbers, revenue, sales, customers, etc. Um, but I feel the more um, shocking evidence is actually the anecdotal evidence that we have from speaking to our customers. Um, people saying they can't even be bothered coming to the town basin anymore. I'm like, I'm in a unique position where I think that there's actually quite a lot of car parking in Whangarei, but um, you know, people really have a thing with car parking in Whangarei, and having that car park within the town base and closed for an extended period of time is a real issue for almost all of our customers. Um, people saying it's not even worth coming, um, you know, they can't be bothered, they're going to go shop elsewhere, etc. We believe that the town basin, as a, as a space and as an area, is an ecosystem and we all need to support each other within that space. Um, and we feel that we need to be equally supported by council um, as the overall proprietor of that area, but also as our landlord. So, we are asking for rent relief. Um, to be considered as part of the annual plan um, for the duration of the project of the car park closure. Um, we feel that this is a completely reasonable request to council um, and we hope that we can be considered for this. Um, there are, however, some other options that we also think would do well to support that application for rent relief such as um, suitable signage for the alternate car parking, the um, gravel pit, which is what we call it on the heart here, some further signage directing people to there, um, as well as some further promotion of the town base into not only the international and the domestic travellers that we have coming through, but also to our local people. Um, thank you. That's all. Any questions? Any questions, councillors? Councillor Hobbs. Just one. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for your presentation, Dean. Thank you. Just apparently, uh, when you say we, that's you and the other four businesses you listed in this Yeah, so I've, we've only, I'm have only i only representing the businesses which I've spoken to directly, which is those four which are the retail based businesses in the town of Sin. Look, Alex, Alex, good submission, good good feedback, actually, really good putting it down in detail what you're asking for. Um, have you been told an exact time when when the park is open? When the car park is open? If it was open earlier, that would be more beneficial. The earlier, the better. But <laughs> no, Appreciate it's already been delayed from the February the closure of it, so I anticipate that it will potentially go on longer. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate that. Um, Councillors, we're now going to move on to uh, Linda. Uh, Linda's got her submission on in volume one, page four twenty-four. And it's good seeing Linda. You've, you've you've got the gist with the five minutes and the four minute bell. You've got I do. Yeah. I do. So I'll leave it all over to you. Okay. Thank you. 
I'm um, here today on behalf of Linda Mason, but my name is also Linda. <laughs> um, so this is Linda's words that I'm going to read out. To the WDC Mayor, Council Staff and District Councillors, I get to both of your proposed rate increases. Option three, the Council undergo a rigorous and critical restructuring process with the key objective to cut costs and reduce heavy bureaucratic overload and start this year with a zero rates increase with a vision to decrease the rates, uh, the rates burden on our people while maintaining or improving the quality of the necessary council function within two years. It is clear today that council's activities are largely dictated by central government and other external interests. The cost of these dictates falls on our local citizens who never get any proper say. It is time to look after ourselves and our people. Why does WDC today find themselves in this predicament? Yes, it is a predicament. You are now going cap in hand to your community who pays your salaries and funds your whims and fancies to ask for more money. You are beggars, albeit with a huge amount of legislative collateral behind you, which means you can force and coerce the people to pay more and more to keep you afloat. I was fortunate to be growing up in the 1970s in this district. I remember the days of the old Whangarei city and county councils before the merger of the two. In those days, council employees were civil servants who earned a modest income with good job security and served their community. Roads were being built and tar sealed, streets were being swept, parks and gardens were developed and maintained, and drains were being cleared regularly by council employees, not contractors. Rates charged were generally an affordable fair share, which was gratefully accepted and paid by the appreciative community. People were happy, healthy, and the community was thriving. Life was good. Nowadays, instead of seeking, respecting, and meeting the needs of the Whangarei community, the council has come, become a corporate entity, just another arm of New Zealand's central government, who of its membership with the LGNZ and various statutory enforcement regulations such as the RMA. The recent succumbence of the district's substantial water supply assets to the central government's control is a very sad example of this. As a result of observing and meeting central government dictates, council employees today are, employing, are employed ticking boxes and forcing unreasonable and costly compliance upon citizens according to the government's predetermined programs. In many cases, the original source for the central government policy comes from unelected global organisations such as the UN, Sustainable Development Goals and the World Economic Forum, Forum Full Surveillance and Smart Cities Here We Come. Where has the critical thinking gone? Where has sound, moral, and prudent financial management gone? Why does the council deem it necessary or acceptable to fund drag queens story time with infants and young children in public library, if not kowtowing to some sick agenda to sexualise or groom children from an early age? When I was growing up in the 70s, drag queens were R18 adult entertainment in the Auckland cabaret scene. Why is it now deemed appropriate to have them educating our kids? Do you all support pedophilia? You tell us that we have to pay to keep the Huntertwasser development afloat. How can this happen when the council driving the original spending was drawling about the massive financial benefits that would be derived by having this facility in our midst? Do we need to consider other tenancy options that can pay the commercial way? Should the council reflect on their lack of wisdom and judgment and the perhaps agreed to stay out of further commercial development, for which the financial burden falls on the ratepayer, and leave it to private enterprise who don't have the power to demand the ratepayer funds their financial risk-taking and or mismanagement. If the Council goes ahead with either of the proposed rates increases without regard for the struggling families and businesses within our community, here are some likely, very likely outcomes. One, financial pressures in local businesses, families and aged communities will increase. They are already stressed by rising interest rates, energy and food costs. Two, mental health pressures will worsen as people increasingly struggle with financial pressure. Three, crime levels will increase as it's already worsened significantly in the last few years and our police and civil security systems are not coping. Four, increasing annoyance and irritation between the general public and council employees. There is no peace, pleasure or prosperity to be found in civil servants who are meant to be serving the interests of the people become dictatorial authorities pushing increasing costs and tick box compliance. We are all one and the Council's top-down policy delivery will only deliver further disunity between the people. The solution is in standing up for the people of this district, for if you stand in our honour, we the people will stand with you. 
The government cannot take away our water supply and steal from the people if you have your community standing with you against the government. Stop taking the orders, disconnect from LGNZ, let's work together again for the betterment of our lives, your lives, our children's future and the integrity of the beautiful natural environment we all love and share. Please hear our voice. We, the Whangarei District community, cannot afford the rate increases you are proposing. Thank you. I appreciate your, your message. Thank you very, very much. Is there any questions, Councillor? Just read, read the point of order. That's the second um, submitter that has suggested that councillors are uh, somehow supportive of pedophilia. I find that I just want to raise a point of order. Yeah. Yeah, really. there, was, there was a question that was posed, and yes, it's, it's not, again, we're not in a place to actually to ask those questions because it's, it's, it's a statement that's been made. Um, so the the you, it you, you comes to down to where the money's been spent, though, and to, to you know, when you're coming to the people and saying, well, yeah, we did, we, we're going to come to the people because we want an interest-free loan, essentially, um, and we don't want to stop our cap house spending, but unfortunately, you, the people, you might just have to think about what groceries you're getting and what bills you can afford to pay because actually we're going to take the money from you. And meanwhile, we're going to go and do these things, which a lot of the people, and I found, find actually morally offensive. No, I appreciate, I appreciate the comments, Linda, and, and again, look, I can't speak for the council, each individual councillors here, but at the end of the day, comments like that aren't really helpful. It's, it's, it's more to turn around and, and try and, with any plans to talk about things which, which you'd like changed. Now, you've listed a whole lot of things, which is awesome, which is great. There's things that we can, we, can, we can look at and have a look through, and we appreciate those sort of comments made, but the other ones infer things which aren't technically correct, okay, so we can't really talk about those. Okay. Yeah. Not yeah. correct in any way. Yeah, we okay, not correct in any way. But what it is, this is what I'm saying is, when it comes to submissions, there's points on your submission which we will take point, we will take notice of. There's some things that we can't take notice of because of the way they're approached, okay? Okay. Uh, is there any other questions? No. Thank you, Linda. We do appreciate you coming in. Is that an insure? Because three motions. Okay. Okay. Um, councillors, I, I now find it strange that we're. Yes, you'd like to hand that around. That'd be great. Um, we're now in a situation where we've we've now come to just over past three o'clock, uh, and that is all submitters. They've all come all earlier, which is really awesome. We've had a couple which have turned around and pulled out. And um, I have, Emily, I have on my list one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, which. We have quite a lot of translations. Okay. And we've had four notions. Okay. No, I, I appreciate the time the councillors have taken to be here. It is vitally important, as, as I said before when, when we first started our meeting, it's vitally important that we actually have these times that we hear from our, our public. Uh, and your plan process is part of that. From here we will go into a deliberations process with the information. Plus on top of that we will be looking through more uh, a way the council can do things and if they can do things better. And as we know when this is it's our process what we do. Um, with that being that, I'm going to ask Councillor Lutka to close us, please. Awesome. Uh, good day. Um, before I close, I just want to um, uh, send a mihi aloha to our friend in uh, Wellington, uh, who was caught up in another year, another tragedy. It feels like we've been uh, had a spate of tragedies over the last couple of weeks. So. So I want to extend my heart to all of those uh, in the fire down in Wellington. Me out to kill off the couple. Uh, yeah, just wrap us up. Uh, one day, and me out to kill off the couple. Me out to kill off the couple. Kia tau, kia tau, kia tau, te atu whara tu ta atu ari ki ai koraiti. Te aro haro te atu a, te nga tahi tanga te wai wata mu. Ake ake. Amen. Thank you to the members of the public for coming in. Thank you for those who are online. Thank you to the councillors for being here. That's absolutely awesome. And to Councillor Jovic, who was online at the beginning of the end of the year. Thank you.